Whiskey evangelism has been around for a long time. I'm not the first evangelist. There have been evangelists for whiskey for hundreds of years. But if I was to ask you to name a contemporary, current-day whiskey evangelist, there's a good chance that you would suggest the guest that's going to be joining us tonight. I'll see you in a second. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everyone. We've got an, a new record tonight, I think. We've got 200 people waiting, watching just now in anticipation for our guest tonight. It's very, very cool to see that support, and it's wonderful to welcome you all again to another Thursday night, to another VPUB session. I hope you're all comfortable. I hope you've got something nice in the glass and ready to hang out and have a wee bit of whiskey time. I have to admit to you all that I have a wee bit of a head cold. I've, I've been troubled by a bit of a head cold over the last few days, but the good news is that it's not bothering me too much, and I certainly have a sense of taste, so there's no issues there. Um, but it just means that I'm a wee bit foggy <laughs> and you, uh, I might sound a wee bit different too. I don't know. Hopefully everything is okay. Very much looking forward to hanging out with our guest tonight. Um, I always considered that with this guest, I would have plenty of time. There's so much energy and there's so much enthusiasm and there's so much what's next on the menu kind of for him. I always thought that he would be around and I would have plenty of time to make a connection with him and find something interesting to bring him in at the VPUB to talk about. Well, it turns out that he's decided there isn't going to be that much time. He's stepping back from public life in, in May this month and it meant that I had to act fast to have a wee appearance from Jim McEwen in the VPUB. And I know you're all excited to hang out with him as well. In the meantime, before I welcome Jim in, I'm going to jump into the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated bar flies. Remember tonight, if you're trying to get my attention, if you type Aquavite or at Aquavite in the YouTube chat, it lights up orange and I can take your questions and I can pick up on your comments and things throughout tonight. If you're watching on Facebook, I will get to your comments, but it'll probably be after the live stream. I do apologise. The chat I'm act interacting with tonight are all the barflies in the lounge here in YouTube. Richie Z is in saying cheers, Roy. Good to see you, Richie. Fantastic. Rolf Ebhead in Norway is in. James Morgan is in as well. Um, James, I'm trying to get your address. I have a sniper coin here for you, buddy. So if you want to send me an email at uh, whiskey at aquavitae.com, I'll get you your sniper coin. I think it was from last week you won that. James, I've been trying to get you. Uh, I reached out to Kilco Brian. Uh, I noticed you in one of his live streams, and I thought he might have your details. Regardless, send me an email, and I'll get it out to you, my friend. Mo is in as well. Evening, Roy. A tiny bit excited about tonight. So am I, Mo. Molasses, so good to see you in, buddy. Whiskey Games, Matt Bishop is in. Pete Head is in. Good to see you. Thomas McCrory, Marcus Kreitner. Um, Gino from Canada, Catherine Bono, that looks like a new name. Good to have you in, Catherine. Nice to welcome you here. Jimmy Jazz, my friend, is in. Mark Gones is in as well. Mark, you might notice I've added a spotlight to your plaque up in the background. I hope you think it's looking well. Nice to see you, Mark, and wonderful to welcome you again. Craig Foss looks like a new name, Craig. Nice to welcome you. Dan Fordham as well. Reb Mordecai is in. Always a pleasure to welcome you, Reb. Uh, uh, multi mission, uh, that's Menno from Belgium, of course, is in as well, just as the chat jumped there. Bruno Martins from Portugal. I laddie, of course. I was hoping, Ron, about hey, that Brook Laddie's one of Brook Laddie's biggest fans would turn up tonight, and here you are. Hey, hey, Roy, having an Isla Malt. Of course, you are, Ron, about fantastic. Eric Cunliffe from, from Canada is in as well. I noticed that somebody has brought me, bought me a wee dram already. Two of you, actually. Daniel Williams has bought me a wee dram to say, have a hot toddy on me, Roy, for the cold, Daniel. Perfect. It's not a hot toddy. It's, it's a, just a regular wee whiskey I have here. Actually, it's not a regular whiskey. I poured this because I wanted something light to start the night. Um, and I always get surprised by this because it's not as light as you might expect. This is really quite flavorful. I think this is one of the best grain whiskies I've ever enjoyed. You can see I've got through quite a lot of this. There's a non-age statement, Tweeddale. This is the grain of truth. It's 46%. It says on the back that it's non-chill filtered and caramel free. And it's very, very flavorful. 
It's obviously good grain whiskey that's come from a good cask. You know, I'm a malt fan. That's where my priorities lie in malt. But I'm always willing to try uh, and uh, understand other things. Um, and that is a good grain whiskey. In fact, I would suggest that if you put that down in a lineup, most folks sipping it wouldn't pick it out as a grain. Jerry Miller has bought me a dram as well, saying, hey, Jim McEwen is so important to me that I paid for the Wi-Fi on this flight so I could watch it live. Thanks to both of you, Roy. Uh, Jerry, that's amazing. I know you're up in the air. You're 35,000 feet up in the air paying for the Wi-Fi. Not only that, you're buying me a virtual dram as well and getting excited about it. Uh, uh, hearing from Jim tonight. Jerry, I'll raise a glass to you. I'll raise a glass to my friend as well, um, uh, Daniel uh, Williams, and also Jimmy Leck, who's just bought me a dram. Uh, I, I want to make sure I catch it. Uh, no, I think I got it. Oh, Apologies to Ralphie and Roddy, but I think this is the most excited I've been for a guest, says Jimmy Legg in Canada. Jimmy, thank you very much for your dram. Thanks to you all for your virtual drams. Cheers to you. I'm just going to get on and get my guest in tonight. I'm not going to um, take up too much time at monologuing about anything. There's only one wee bit of housekeeping that I want to do. I want to say happy birthday to somebody. I want to raise a glass to my cousin, Kevin. Kevin Grant on Whiskey. He's doing his own YouTube thing now for Whiskey on YouTube. Um, and he's a big fan of the big man that's on tonight as well. But my cousin, Kevin, has shares a birthday today. And I would like to raise a glass and share this picture with everyone. Here we have a nice image here, and you can see who he's standing with. Cousin Kevin is standing with Jim McEwen and Jim's wife, Barbara. And this was at the original launch of the Water of Life film back in the before times, before the pandemic and everything kicked in. I'll raise a glass and I hope everybody will join me in wishing Cousin Kevin a very happy birthday. Many happy returns, buddy. Nice to have you in. And I do believe that Kevin is joining us tonight. Anyways, I opened with tonight, I was talking about the idea that I am not in the first, although the channel is built on sharing whiskey and whiskey evangelism, I'm very aware that I'm not the first evangelist, and I'm certainly probably not the first to use that phrase, even when it comes to the context of whiskey. But the guy that I'm welcoming in tonight, you can never fail to be astonished at the energy, the enthusiasm, the raw passion, the fun, the curiosity, and the, the just what he brings to whiskey and the whiskey scene over his career. I think that evangelism is a pretty perfect word to describe it. I hope he feels okay with that as well. Al has bought me a dram as well to say, Roy, you're a legend getting Jim on the V-Pub tonight. Thank you. And here's to a great evening, exciting times. Al, thank you very much for your drama, friend. Cheers to you. I'm getting through this wee grain whiskey fast tonight. I need to keep the sips small. I hope that Jim's okay with that being a, an adjective. Um, to describe him and his career. 58 years in whiskey, and it's an absolute privilege for me to reach out to Jim McEwen and welcome him. Welcome, Jim. Welcome behind the bar. Thank you. EPUB. What a pleasure to have oh, you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Are you well, Jim? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm top for him. Uh, just quite interesting to hear some guys coming in from uh, Canada. A lot of my, I spent a lot of my time on the road in Canada. I used to do a lot of teaching at LCBO, uh, which was always fun. Uh, and I've been in some strange, strange places. I remember, I remember probably my wildest gig ever was in a place called Saskatoon. You ever heard of Saskatoon? I think I've heard of it, Saskatoon. Yeah. yeah. And what province would that be? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> somebody will tell us where Saskatoon is. But anyway, uh, I'll anytime remember. we hear anybody talking about the LCBO, it's never in a positive light because of the state controlled um, issues that they have by province. And I think the people in Alberta are happy, but everywhere else in Canada, they seem to complain about it. Um, but uh, well, they do get a bad press, but the people who work for them are just regular Joes like you and I. I mean, they're just happy to have a job. Yeah, yeah. It's a government organisation, so the security there. And I have to say that the training the LCBO give their team is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they're well coached, which is really, really good. Fantastic. I remember in I remember in Toronto, I was in a tasting there uh, for LCBO, and they brought them in from all over the place. There must have been a hundred representatives of LCBO. So I went to the LCBO desk to pick up my whiskey. 
And there was a big guy <coughs> sitting behind a kind of glass screen with a grill on it. <laughs> and I showed him my business card and I said, uh, I'm here to pick up some uh, whiskey. I'm doing a tasting tonight. He said, oh, I can't give it to you. You need written approval to take it. I said, you're kidding. I've just flown in from Scotland. I know the whiskey's behind you. I can see it in the boxes and you can't give it to me. He said, no, I can't. you got to have a letter to give it to me. <clears throat> this is the LCBO. They're so strict yeah. and all that union shit, you know. I said, well, that's fine. <clears throat> that's not a problem. I'm just going to leave now. I'm going to go to my hotel and have a good night's sleep. And I hope you enjoy doing the tasting. He said, um, well, you please yourself. I said, yeah, I'm going to leave now. And at that point, one of the managers came in and he said, is there a problem? I said, yeah, I've travelled all the way from Scotland. I've sent dozens of bottles out here to train your staff throughout the province. And your man here, desperate Dan, I said, <laughs> he's not going to give me the whiskey. So it's been really nice talking to you guys. So I'm heading for the airport now, and I wish you all <coughs> a very good evening. And the guy said, oh, hold on, sorry, sorry, mate. And he spoke to this numpty. Uh, <coughs> I don't know where you understand the word numpty, but I'm sure you do. Absolutely, we do. Uh, I was. I discovered that it was they were very heavily unionised, and they hung everything exactly right. There was no leeway. So uh, it was quite funny. Uh, that time, because I was prepared to walk out the door, I couldn't give a shit, you know. Uh, if you don't want to give me my whiskey back, that's fine. I'll just carry on. So, uh, but I had some great times with LCDO. Great. You would have, you would have jumped at the chance to to catch up on some jet lag, probably, and and have a wee, uh, a wee rest and let him take care of the tasting. Uh, I, I have to say that the, the folk that are in tonight, Jim, the internet knows no borders, right? So we're, it's a completely global audience everybody from all over the place. Um, but our Canadians are shouting uh, Saskatchewan. So ah, I don't know yeah. if you have suggestion that that's the, the right way to say uh, the, the, the spot that you were mentioning earlier. I've had a couple of drams. I should I should shout these out real quick uh, just before they, they disappear and I miss them. The chat is coming fast tonight. Whiskey Central, she's a big fan of yours, Jim. Uh, she likes her Brook Laddie and she's getting into Port Charlotte as well. And she says, thank you, Roy. I'm so excited for this stream. I'm a total Brook Laddie fan, girl. Thank you, Jim, for making my favourite whiskey, says Sheila in Mexico, an American liver in Mexico. And Alice saying... Uh, Oh, I, I, I picked up yours, Al. I'll just, there's one more that I've missed. Who have I missed? Oh, Connor Con Connoisseur is in. I raise a glass of MRC01. That's the Muthon Rothschild, isn't it? I know I yeah. wasn't released under Jim, but it's still my all time favourite Brick Laddie whiskey. Slancha, Roy, and Jim. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Oh, Sheila. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> But listen, Jim, I called you, I, my adjective I used to describe you, I don't know how it sits on your shoulders, an evangelist, that passion, that energy that you've taken, um, I guess it was, uh, you would have built it up over the years throughout your career, from originally starting 15 years old as a Cooper, throughout all your time, all the positions that you had right throughout your time at uh, Bamoa, and then before you moved on to Brook Laddie, you were already out on the road, you would have been taking that passion out there, you would have been building that energy, how does that term sit with you? Would you would you feel yourself that you're an evangelist for whiskey? Well, in certain cases, uh, you were an evangelist because everybody was well acquainted with blended whiskey, but uh, not so not so confident with single malt whiskey. But that wasn't their fault. That education was not out there. Uh, when I started on the road, there was about another four brand ambassadors. There was Richard Patterson was out there, David Stewart was out there. There was very few of us, and the world's a big place. And there was, there was about six guys from Scotland who were out there regular. There were six guys to teach the world. It's an enormous task. It's huge. Sure. But we were the sort of we were the guys, the pioneers that went across the prairie. Uh, and for me, it was doubly hard because I had a heavy peated malt. Yeah. In the war. And uh, I remember uh, doing a tasting, my first tasting in Korea. And uh, my not my first tasting, my first tasting in Korea. And they had never experienced peat before. And you want to have seen the faces on them. You think it was poison, man. Yeah. They were spewing up their faces. They were spitting it out. You know, it was just like, Crazy, you know. I and I, I remember, I remember a, a, an interview with Bessie Williamson of Lefroy back in the day, talking about how nobody wanted to drink this this really strongly powerful flavored malt. And even Ian MacArthur down at Lagavulin 
he's probably he, the same as you. He, he remembers a time that they couldn't sell Isla whiskey. Yeah, yeah. You Back in the seventies and eighties, right, you couldn't give it away. Well, that's, yeah. That was uh, the value. I mean, people talk about brand ambassadors, and they're they're much maligned and uh, probably underpaid as well. But without them, the world would never have known. You know, as I said to you before, Jesus Christ gave it to the world with twelve disciples. Scotland gave it to the world when I started with six disciples. You know, I can tell I can tell you the names of the six guys. <laughs> surely and surely, education is what it's all about: honesty and authenticity and quality. They get all that, and you, you can be really, really confident. If you're trying to punt something or <clears throat> sell something that you don't believe in yourself, then you're really on the back foot. But when you believe in it passionately, it's not just the spirit comes through; it's your spirit as well. And you're talking yeah. about it; they can see the emotion, you know. So. Uh, yeah, it was, it was in the early days, it was really scary, you know. Can you imagine if you hit a Lafroy cast strength as your first malt? Oh, <laughs> my God. I'll Did tell you, you what is interesting, though, Jim. In modern times, and I don't know if you've witnessed this, but the biggest um, success that I've had in, in evangelizing my friends, if you like to enjoy malt whiskey, it tends to be an Isla, a Lafroy, a Lagavulin, something like that. A hook, a big punch of flavour. And I don't know if it's just because we're enjoying strong flavours and strong coffees and spicy food and all these kind of things in, in, in kind of modern times. Or if it's just the fact that it's just that bold whiskey that has a flavour that's a wee bit different to them from just that generic whiskey yeah. taste that they assume they're familiar with. Um, yeah, it, seems to be, it seems to be a powerful ambassador for whiskey now, Isla whiskey. Well, it's like it's a kind of benchmark for single malt drinkers. You know, you start off maybe the lowland, you do space light and all that, but <clears throat> eventually you will get to Isla. And the taste difference between the Isla is a heavy peated, I'm talking about, like the Optimona for Charlotte's and other and that, and a regular space light, it's night and day. So <clears throat> it's great. You can have something that's unpeated or you can have something that's heavy peated or medium peated. And it's just a case of the mood you're in. It's not necessarily the whiskey you like all the time. It depends what mood I'm in, what I drink. Yeah. Sometimes I need a real, if I've been out walking, uh, I like to come home and I will have an Optimore. Not a big dram, just a reasonable sized dram, uh, size strength. And after a long walk, I just get that surge of power going into me from Optimore. Whereas in another time, I might be doing something more gentle. I'll do a Brooklady Classic, which is my favourite model of all time. Uh, so it depends on the company and the mood that you're in. It's really a mood thing. And uh, you've heard Absolutely. it said a thousand times, I could go a real good dram. Yeah, but we all know what our good dram is. We all have our favourites. Yeah. And uh, it's just it's a great spirit. It will revive the dead. There's no doubt about it. See that I'm picking up. So you, you know you've done it 58 years, Jim. 58 years, and you, you the way you're speaking just now, and the way that you just kind of that throwaway statement there. It's a great drama. It's a great spirit. It's a great thing. You still love it. You still clearly love it today. But now you're at the stage where, and, and we, I know I was there. I heard you talking about your retirement in 2015, and then it, you know within a within 18 months or a year or two, you know you were talking about helping Ardna Ho and getting on board with Ardna Ho. And then you step back, you'd done your job at Ardna Ho, you'd, you'd, you'd birthed a new Isla distillery or helped uh, realise a new Isla distillery. And then we, held, we heard about your activity that you were getting involved in down in Australia and things. And there was just this idea that either you couldn't help yourself, the, the, but there was this idea that you were just, that you, retirement just wasn't going to look good on you, it's never going to be your thing. But that's changed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... I should probably, it's a very personal thing. It's how you are physically, mentally, and spiritually when you get to that age. And I was not ready for sitting back doing some knitting in front of the fire. Oh, there was still a job to be done, you understand? I still had things I want to achieve, like going down and making whiskey in Australia, uh, making gin in Australia, and that sort of stuff. So, um, But you can only do that if you truly love it. You don't do that for the money. I was never in it for the money. I was in it for the challenge and the passion and the satisfaction in people's faces when they taste it. That's what yep. it was all about. It was never about the money, that's for sure. But and I also regard it as a great privilege. I'm 100% Scottish. If you cut me open, you'll see Scotland inside. I'm so <laughs> proud of my country. I'm so proud of its national spirit, whiskey. Um, it's, we are, I know why God gave it to us. He gave it to us because we would look after it and cherish it. 
And that's why we got it. Why did he choose us? Because he understood the Scots and he gave us whiskey. And I truly believe that. He gave us a rough country with a wild coastline, peat bogs everywhere and all that sort of stuff. It's a hard environment. So he gave us something special and that was whiskey. And, and we have looked after it. We really have looked after it as a nation and we cherish it. Um, so I'm, just, I'm delighted to have had the career I had, uh, when they asked me anything, can you do it? I said, yeah, my hand was up for everything. Whether I could do it or not, my hand was up. I would soon yeah. learn to understand. Yeah, I can do that. I haven't a bloody clue, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> I can do it. So that kind of that was my kind of attitude. Just keep learning all the time. Well, well right. let me ask you then, do you think, because I think it's nice to talk to somebody who's been in the industry as long as you have, to contrast modern-day whiskey landscape versus the... Um, let's say the old days of the 60s and the 70s and things. Do you think, well, we can talk about the whiskey in a second. Let's talk about the people first and the jobs and the roles that you're talking about. Do you think that that's still happening? Is that still being encouraged in whiskey just now, that you're reaching out to younger people and you're bringing them through the ranks and all the different roles, all the different positions through production processes, all the yeah. dirty jobs and the, the interesting jobs, the engineering jobs, the scientific jobs, and then into kind of sales and marketing roles. Is that still happening in the industry today, you think? Oh, very much so. There's not so many dirty jobs now. When I started, it really was dirty jobs. I mean, you're coal fire stills, you know, you're huge. Automation, just think, yeah. yeah. Just you think of them, <clears throat> the old stills where there's coal fires below them, a coal called anthracite. And you had to control the temperature inside the still with shovelfuls of coal or a water hose to cool the fire down. Yeah. I mean, that was incredible. Now computers control the still, but the stillman was in charge and his flames were licking around the side of the still, get the hose out, the temperature would drop, and then he's trying to bring it up again. It was really, really difficult. So these old distillers, long before the computers came along, they were so talented. And uh, they liked to drink too. I mean, I remember... Uh, that will more when I'd offer them an old dram or a new dram at five o'clock every night in Scotland in the distilleries. There was a five o'clock dram at every distillery, and half the village of Bomore would come in. You understand, they didn't want the distillery, but they would join the queue. And, and the manager was a nice guy and pour them a dram and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes you got a bag of potatoes in response, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> but people actually, the the five o'clock dram was much cherished. It was 68.5, it was right off the still. And right. oh my God, they loved it. It was just amazing. Uh, and I remember um, when the silent season came to the distillery, when the distillery shut down to clean the boiler and sort the stills and all that, it was shut for about two months. And then there was no new spirit. So I would be sent to the warehouse for the manager with a, a one-gallon uh, uh, plastic container. And he said, go and pick a good dram for the boys. Now I'm going to pick a really good 19-something-something, something, all of those of sherry. That was the five o'clock dram. And the guys hated it. They missed the new spirit. Oh, not this bloody sherry stuff again. We was up with that sherry. We want the, the white stuff. You know, it was quite amazing how you could... Because whiskey in you is delicious. I mean, I'm not advocating yeah, a yeah. new spirit, but it's really, really good. So, uh, yeah, a huge change. And then when the dram was stopped, Bomore Distillery was the first distillery in Scotland to stop the five o'clock dram. And they gave the people a bottle a month. So Bomore led the way in that respect. Because a lot of the folk, when they got the five o'clock dram, it was 68.5. It's a big That's bump. I would stop a horse at 40 metres, you know what I mean? Yeah. But these guys would just drink it down. The tap was running beside him. Drink the dram under the tap. Thank you very much, sir. Next one, dram, water, and out. And that was then when that alcohol in them, they would head for the pub. And they wouldn't get home till 7, 30, 8 o'clock and they'd be half cut, you know what I mean? They'd be, well, so the best thing that happened was the stopping of the 5 o'clock dram and giving the, the staff a bottle. That was revolutionary. And Bomore was the first to study in Scotland to do that. That's incredible to think about that happening and today. We know that it happened. Oh. We know about dramming. We know about the concept. We know why it was done, and it was done to keep the spirits up, if you like, and stop the stealing and the theft and things. And I know we're going to touch a wee bit on that a bit later. But let me ask you then more about, rather than the roles of the the, you know, if you talk about the whiskies and you talk about those casks that you might have been able to pick from in order to fill your plastic container there, 
what do you think's happened in your career, Jim, since since nineteen sixty three when you started until today? In terms of whiskey, I I feel like you and I have a similar outlook here that because there are loads of folk out there that bemoan the old days, what used to be available. Um, and that doesn't really matter to a lot of us because even if it was better, we can't afford it, we can't buy it. But I personally think that in terms of variety, consistency of quality, uh, you know, the choice, the the, uh, the innovation, the amount of distilleries, the amount of malt whiskey that's available, I kind of feel like we've never had it better, but I'd definitely be interested in your take on that, your, your opinion. I, I would definitely say it's more consistent. I'm not saying it's better than it was then. Uh, in the old days when it was coal fire still, and the, the mash time was what it was, you know, was it getting all the sugars out of it, was it not? Fermentation times and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's much, much better today. There is no uh, very few coal fire distillers anymore. The temperature control is great within the still. It's like you trying to make a pot of soup. If you turn the cooker up by one degree, what happens? It comes over the top. It's the same inside a pot still. You've just got to get it in the boil and just keep it there so it's not going up the neck of the still, you understand? So it's just the vapour that's going up rather than the spirit. And I've seen it myself in my younger days. If the still had too many drams, you would see it gushing into the spirit safe pouring in. You understand? It was boiling it too hard, so it wasn't, you wasn't getting the vapour. That was the liquid going, going right through the condenser. Um, so, yeah, it was tough times with coal fires and inefficient equipment, I would say. And, of course, there was a lot of drums being drunk as well. Uh, one of the favourite tricks was <clears throat> most of the people who did this are now deceased. The whiskey was gathered in a wooden vat. The new spirit was beside <clears throat> the spirit safe, right? And the spirit safe, new spirit, went into this vat called the SRWV, the Spirit Receiver <coughs> Vessel. And what the boys used to do, they are very clever, it had a dip rod in it. So you could dip down to see how much spirit was in it. You've got a reading and then you'd look at the book and that told you had, I don't know, maybe 100 gallons or something like that. They were very, very clever. What they would do is, it was like called milk in the cow sort of thing. They would shave the side of the dip rod. You got it? So yeah. it, was, it was loose inside, it was, it was in a holder, right? Yeah. It down. And I would shave down the side of the dipstick and then they'd put it down and I would just quick it up. They'd just throw it up very quickly. It was on a pulley. And yeah. then there was a sponge and hold the sponge at the bottom. And then all the whiskey would run down into the sponge and then you would see them, it's like taking tequila. They'd be squeezing it into their mouth like that. <laughs> <laughs> so long before tequila was going to, they were doing it in Isla, you know, the sponge, you know what I mean? You could hear it was called milk in the cow. So the condition of these of these production members, that you think that this is having a, an effect on the consistency of the spirit produced? Not a chance. No. <laughs> <laughs> and really they were still good. functioning. Yeah. yeah. So there was many, many ways of stealing whiskey. It was really, really incredible. Um, I think you, I mentioned- you touched when we spoke the other day. You touched on a fun story about, and I did look for this, and you're absolutely right. We have something in the UK called salad cream that comes in a glass, a very thin glass bottle. Um, unfortunately, uh, you can still buy it, but it's only available here and there. It's not everywhere. Um, it's in plastic now. But these, why was why was salad cream such a popular thing in Scotland, Jim? Well, the, the shape of it was perfect. If I hold this glass up here, right? Yep. All right, I'll hold that there. <clears throat> and if you imagine this is a, uh, let me get this right, this is a salad cream. I can't get this right. Uh, let me move this a little Wait, bit. Hang on a second, I'll One, be able to help you here. There you go. Your salad cream bottle would fit right inside the cask, Okay. And then you had your string round the neck of the salad cream bottle, drop it down, <clears throat> pull it up, stick it in your pants, and away you went. I never did that. I hated salad cream. Of course. Uh, <laughs> I hated salad cream. <laughs> uh, I Whiskey that, Throttle Daniel is saying, buy my friend Jim a dram. Been a long time since he's come to Canada, and I'm still cherishing my signed bottle of DNA. Hope he returns here soon. Ask about when he was in school with James McTaggart from... James oh, right, yeah, 
yeah, uh, great lad, Gene. But there was, uh, yeah, there was a lot of great characters, but I have to say there was a lot of great distillers. There was no computers, and there was guys who were, like, conducting an orchestra. They could just watch the still, <clears throat> watch the little flappers start to flap, and you would just, the whiskeys come in, and the steam just absolutely right. The, the sheer talent of these old guys, even though they had a few drums inside them, they were fantastic distillers. Now it's all computerized. But some guys just had the knack of just getting the middle cut absolutely perfect, you know, and they were great. Um, yeah. <clears throat> happy days. There was a lot of drinking went on, but they seemed to have a tolerance for it. Myself, in my lifetime, I never, ever queued up for a new dram. Never. Except for one time, uh, I was <coughs> I was at bed. <coughs> you ever hear of a ship called a puffer? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Uh, a puffer is an old uh, <coughs> vessel that used to ply it from the Clyde to Isla. Yes. To, they bring the barley in, they bring the coal in, and um, they would <coughs> then they would take the whiskey back, and uh, that was a harem scarem thing. Can you imagine? <coughs> All these guys in the puffer, they're straight out of Berlin in prison. There's no doubt about it. About it. There's scars on their faces, bolts on their necks, bits of their head missing. You, you, it was hard men that were working the puffers. It was really, really quite amazing. So I used to stand by. I had to have a cooper standing by because as they swung the barrels over, if they dropped them too quickly, the head would shift and they would start leaking. You understand? Yes. If you, if you drop it down too quickly, yep. the head is made of, of, of different pieces and they would <clears throat> come apart a bit and you'd be there. Uh, I'd be there, shout for the cooper, I'd go down. By the time I got down, they'd fill their bottles and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So as the day went on, the guy on the crane, he got drunk because he's drinking it. The guys in the hold are watching. I'd be standing in the hold of this puffer and I'd see two hogsheads and chains coming across missing the hold of the ship and go right over the Atlantic Ocean. And then about 10 seconds later, the same two bars are swishing by again because the guy on the crane was totally drunk. <laughs> he didn't know what he was doing. And then the two bars would go again. And eventually he'd find this is the hold of a ship. And eventually he would manage to get it down into the hold. And sometimes they dropped it too from too much of a height and they'd shift the heads. And that was the start of a, a drunken day. Talk about health and safety. When, when are we going back to? Is this is this the 1960s. 70s? The 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think the best thing that happened was the stopping of the five o'clock round. That was really, really good. And we got a bottle a month, which was great. Because for the guys who didn't take the five o'clock round, they were getting nothing. You understand? Right. So when the bottle came out once a month or more, they got something to take home. But uh, yeah, it was quite a. Uh, quite a serious thing, the five o'clock drum. And half the town would come in. You'd see farmers coming in and window feeders <laughs> coming in. And also, I never even knew they were in the distillery. They didn't want the distillery, just coming in for the drum. Just coming in for the drums. Daniel Caballero has bought a drum. He's, I think, Daniel, you're in Colombia. Nice to have you in, my friend. Always nice to welcome you here. I'd like to know more about Jim's work with Arnaho and Arnaho's future. Congrats on a great career. Cheers to you. Uh, that's Daniel Caballero, as he says, from Colombia. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much for your drama. Yeah, Thanks thank for the yeah. for, for for Jim. Um, I, I think I think what we'll do if we'll kind of follow up. We, I do want to talk about Arnaho, but we maybe try and run this chronologically if we can. Take a conversation anywhere you like, Jim. But if we're you're back in the sixties there, and the, the, eventually in the late seventies, the days of dramming had to end. It's interesting that they replaced it with giving the staff a bottle. Um, I don't know if that happened everywhere, but it seems like a, a good yeah, scheme. Is, yeah. um, and then, so then you've got lots and lots of changes happening. And it strikes me that one of the biggest changes, and we can maybe use the Bamore Brook Laddie comparison here. There was a time that before you were involved in Brook Laddie, before it was resurrected and revived, Brook Laddie would not have been doing what you ended up doing at Brook Laddie. Brook Laddie would have been for fillings, it would have been a contract malt distillery, much the same way that the majority of Bamore would have been back in the day as well. Do you th Has that changed the way the, the whiskey is made at all, the idea that most of it in modern times, uh, certainly in the case of Brook Laddie, is going to be for single malt sake? Has that changed much? Has it changed any of the process or any of the, the, the strategy about the production? Well, you don't change the process at all. 
<clears throat> but that never changes. It's like the doomsday book, you understand? This yep. is how we do it, and we do it consistently all the time. The one thing that does change is the quality of the cars or the type of cars, whether it's a bourbon car, sherry car, wine car, whatever. That's where the changes are made. The quality of spirit never, ever changes. It's always really, really good. And now they've got gas chromatography that can check it all out, that this batch is the same as the other batch. When I started, the distillery manager would nose it, and he would taste it and compare it with the one from the previous week. It was all done on the nose and the taste. And it still is today, but really you've got a computer to, to back you up. So uh, as I said earlier, I think the quality of the spirit was good then, but it wasn't so consistently good. Today it is 100% consistent. Also, the main thing is the quality of the casks. The quality of the cask today has never been better just because there's so much American oak coming in. Bourbon yeah. has taken off. And the bourbon distiller can only use the cask once. So there's this huge amount of bourbon cask available to the Scots, which is really fantastic. So you're not seeing so many refill casks or second refill casks, or indeed sometimes third refills. They were quite common 25, 30 years ago. So the biggest, biggest change has, apart from the, the quality of distillation, is the quality of the cask. And I said to <coughs> you, the spirit is the child and the cask is the mother. If the child goes to a mother with no milk, it will die for sure. That's the same with whiskey. If whiskey is in a cask, it's got nothing left because it's been filled three times. The whiskey has no chance. So that's the big and biggest change is the quality assurance now. Everybody's really into quality. And I don't think single malt has ever been better than it is at the moment. And the variety as well. These studies that were never heard of, they were used for blending, they're now available. So the consumer has this fantastic selection and he will Absolutely. find one to suit himself. And it's a different whiskey for a different time of day or a different mood. You know, even in Isla today, our funeral, as you look before you leave the church the churchyard and you said goodbye to the deceased, the family will all come round with bottles of whiskey and pour your last dram before you leave the churchyard. You just need that little hit because you're you're in a state of sorrow because you've said goodbye to a friend. And that happens right beside the grave. And I think it's a great tradition that they still do that. That's the family style. And then the, the women will come down and they will come down with scones and cheese. So you don't leave the churchyard until you've had your dram. This is an old style when people used to walk miles to a funeral. You know, and then they'd have to walk miles back to the farm in the, in the yeah. wind and the rain. So if you come to Ireland and you see a funeral, you can be sure they're having a dram, which is a yeah. great Thing. Yeah, and it was that kind of idea that it wasn't just kind of a a toast. There was there was a sustenance there. There was a, a, a an invigoration to be had from the from the dram as well. I know I've heard you talk about that sometimes. That if you're going for a walk or something, depending on the dram that you have, you can either be energized or you can be relaxed by mm. by the jam the dram that you choose. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic drink, and as long as you don't abuse it. But I mean. The level of knowledge out there through guys like yourself and programs like this, you're getting into the nitty gritty. You know, it's not just the, the brand ambassadors who do a great job talking about their specific product. It's guys like you and sites like you are educating. That's really, really important because there's nothing to hide. It's a clean, clean business. There's nobody cheating or anything like that. The quality is there and the passion is still there. Really, absolutely, and that's the, that's the word, Jim. It's passion that drives it all. It really, really is. I, I put out I put out a few questions to the community, and I've I've picked a few. I know that there's going to be questions in in the lounge here, uh, lots and lots of them. Um, I, I'll do my very very best, but I'm engrossed by most of what Jim's sharing with us. Um, uh, Gary Carew is saying anyone familiar with his energy, passion, and dedication to his task throughout his career will know he was evangelizing at every opportunity. Yep, I'm starting to get that, says Gary. Absolutely. Uh, my yeah. patrons have given a couple of questions here. I'll, I'll ask a, an easy one to start with if, if you're okay with it, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Bud Jenkins, uh, my friend Bud uh, over, uh, Bud, I think you're in the States, aren't you, my friend? Certainly North America for sure. Second, he's asking, uh, when, when Jim settles back into his quieter private life, what bottles, well, I, I think I could answer this, but I won't, uh, what bottles will he always have in his cabinet? I've actually got hundreds of bottles. <laughs> <laughs> My loft is full of bottles. 
<laughs> let's, imagine, let's imagine then that you've got a wee cabinet, you've got no whiskey, you own nothing, you've got no legacy or collection over the years, Jim, and you're going to go out to your local place and you're going to buy a few souvenirs. The, 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 the type of whiskeys that we can buy as a community today, and you're going to you're going to sneak them back to your fireside in your cabinet there. What, what's it going to be? What would you be picking? Well, I've got a few treasured possessions. I mean, I've got a few bottles of Black Moor, which I knew intimately because I filled the barrels of Sherry Butts in 1964. <laughs> you know, I've got a few of these bottles. That was just incredible. And uh, So not only would you have filled the, the been there when those casks were filled, but you were probably involved in the coopering of the casks that were filled. No, 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 no. no. You weren't? They were first filled Sherry Butts. Right, yeah, okay. Directly yeah. from Spain. We did not build them. They were sherry butts all the roses. They came over, they came over whole, yes. Top condition. Uh, and uh, Yeah, it was one of the great drums. It was in the number one vaults, just right beside the ocean, you know, and Bumwood is still the number one. The sea actually hits the wall, and the, the atmosphere and the, the moisture level was great. And so Black Bumwood was probably one of the greatest whiskies ever created. And that was because of the quality of the cast. The distillate was the same, you understand? They didn't make a special whiskey to go in for his black art. It was the quality of the sherry butts at that time. I don't think you can get the same quality of sherry cast today because if I ask you the question, when did you last buy a bottle of all the rules of sherry? I'm asking you that question. When did you well, last buy well, well, tr Truthfully, Fortunately, I have bought one, <laughs> but only out of curiosity, Jim. Only out of curiosity, not because I'm enjoying it and drinking it. You're, you make a fantastic point, and, and we, we do talk about it. We, no one is drinking enough sherry now to sustain that style of, of whiskey. It's a great shame. However, the, 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 we were probably up to the with the first to use wine casks. I was using wine casks. Mark yep. and Simon could get me shot of this and shot of that and all that stuff. And some of the results were absolutely fantastic, that fruit flavour coming through. And it gives the, the, con, the consumer something else. The bourbon cask is king. There's no doubt about that. It's very, very difficult to get sherry cask for the reasons I've just said. But there's more people drinking wine now than any other time in the history of the world. The varieties of wine available to the consumer are phenomenal. So the cask available to the Scottish distiller now is just endless. And some of the flavours you get, I didn't did a, as you know, I did a, a product called Black Art, and I used yeah. several different kinds of wine, and it was yeah. absolutely delicious. So yeah, we've, it's it's in good shape. The quality of the cask is everything. And I mean, I was using Sotern cask. I was using, I can't say the names because I'll get fined if I use the names. You know, That's but, right. With it, depending uh, on the chateaus, it was, it was a, <clears throat> a full-bodied red wine, or whether it was a Sotern and all that sort of stuff. It was just magical. Absolutely magical. Superb, superb. Block in Canada has bought me a drum. Say all the best for your retirement, Jim. Roy, thank you. thank you for all that you continue to do for the community. Hopefully Jim can check in on the VPUB once a year. He's always welcome to come by and tell a story. Thank you very much, Block, my friend. Thank you for your virtual drum. Well, Cheers, well to answer that question, <clears throat> he, he hopes I pop in once a year. That depends if whether I get my payment for this shot because I still wait on the money. You're such I'm a gonna, I was just going to offer you a bottle of whiskey, Jim, but you've got plenty. You are, you are such a miserable bugger, you know that. I'm still <laughs> waiting in the check. So uh, this could be my first and last appearance. I actually, show. there's been a misunderstanding. I actually thought you were paying me. <laughs> no, no, no. I sent in my bill. It was for £10 plus VAT, so there you go. Get well, if you stay with us, if you don't pull a parachute on us early... <laughs> We'll work out the details afterwards. <laughs> Superb. Well, there's enough drams being bought here tonight that I certainly owe you something, Jim. <laughs> it's too funny. Tom Harris saying, I'm doing my best drinking Madeira to have Madeira casks available. Tom, wonderful to welcome you in. And that's much the same as Sherry, obviously. If you're drinking Madeira casks, we hope. Yeah, yeah. Go off yeah, and be, be yeah. Jason McDonald is saying, maybe worth asking if he's finally ready to disclose the composition of the Black Art series. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is now. Um, it was a <clears throat> oh I can't just remember sorry 
There you go, Jason. I just, got, yeah, I just got my mind there. Well, I'll come back to you in a minute. I'm Jason, sorry. you need to you need to ask questions that, that that only Jim can answer. I could have answered that one. A big a big fat a big fat no. No, black um, was, and people got really really upset. Oh, you, you must tell us what it's about. No, I said I don't have to tell you anything. I'm a free man. I can tell no, you. No, and I think that that's one of the fun things about it. We've always known that the Black Arts was your kind of a creation. It was a whimsical thing. You were never going to tell anybody, and maybe apart from the likes of Adam or somebody like that, that's the only people that would get to know. Um, and, and I think that that was okay for most of us. We were just going to relax with it and enjoy it as a whiskey, much in the same way that we would a blended malt or a nice blend, something that we don't know what the makeup is. That idea that we're all kind of getting our geek on is fantastic, and there's lots of whiskies out there that we can dial in through the transparency programs at Brookladdy. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, and, ver and various other transparency programs like that, if we want to get our geek on, we can dial in and find out all the ins and outs that we want. Sometimes something like Black Arts teaches us that just enjoy yeah. the whiskey. You don't, you don't need to know everything. Warner in the States has bought me a dram, the one glass man Warner. He said, cheers, gentlemen. Thank you, Jim, for your passion and your dedication. The Laddie 10 started it all for me a few years back, and Brook Laddie yeah. became a true magical distillery for me, and the journey continues. That's from my friend Warner in yeah. the States. Warner, it's wonderful to have you in. I'm actually going to go on to my second dram just now, which is a wonderful Bamor. Uh, my favourite Bamor, Jim, is from an ex-bourbon cask. If it's been left quietly for long enough, I enjoy it very, very much. Teenage years at least, and I think it brings out that lovely tropical side of Bamor. This is very tropical and mango, and this would have been made probably in your last year at Bamor. This is a 2001 vintage from North Star, and it's uh, no, the no, best. No, no, no. No, you're way off there. You're a way off there. You think? I was at, I was at Bumore. <clears throat> oh, I sorry. I, I left Bumore. Uh, I was at Bumore for, I went to Bumore in 1963. I, I served my time as a cooper and as a head warehouse keeper. And then <clears throat> uh, from 1963 to 1975, I was cooper training, head warehouse keeper. And then in 1976, uh, until 1984, I went to Glasgow as a blender. I was trained as a blender. As I told Just you, down the road from me, right here. Yeah. yeah, and then I went back to the war in nineteen at the end of nineteen eighty four, and I stayed there till nineteen ninety six as a distillery manager. Uh, and then, but, but then, then you were out. But yes, I was on the road. I was so from ninety seven to two thousand and one. I was traveling the world, and then in two thousand and two, I got the call from Bruce Laddy. I had a great job at Bermont. I was traveling around the world, and people think that's good. It was terrible. It was high pressure, a lot of travelling, not seeing the family, late nights, early morning flights, trying to teach people. Some people just came along to get drunk, you know, and you're, you're days away from home. But that was the evangelist side of it. That's when you're educating the consumer. Yes. Now, you can educate them. There's every chance they will follow it. What's lacking is education. You won't buy anything you don't know anything about. Yep. So the more information... Honest information you can give the consumer. No smoke and mirrors. Just tell them as it is and leave them to decide <clears throat> on the quality of it. Uh, so I certainly enjoyed the ambassadorial work. And then um, I got the call to Brooklady. And as I said to you before, I used to look across when I was managing the war. i look across the lock at Brooklady and it was dead. The village was dead. It was just, it was Cinderella. Cinderella. Never got to the ball. People said Brufladi was not a true isla because it wasn't smoky. And then I got a phone call from the, <clears throat> the chairman of Brufladi at that time, Sir John McTaggart, just buying a distillery. And I was <clears throat> standing at the wall overlooking the lock and doll, looking at Brufladi. And I thought, someday somebody's going to open that distillery. <clears throat> and not long after that, I got a phone call from Sir John McTaggart. And he said, hi, Jim, my name is Sir John McTaggart. I said, yeah, I know you well because you put the money into the swimming pool in Isla. You know, he put a huge amount of money. And the swimming pool was heated by the water from the distillery. How cool is that, you know? <laughs> yeah. I often thought I should send some whiskey down and break the world's speed record for the backstroke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was a real thought. 
And uh, Sir John McTaggart said, hi, Jim. He said, my name is Sir John McTaggart. Uh, I said, I know you, sir, from your time at the swimming pool. And he said, uh, we're thinking of buying Brooklady. Um Would you consider joining us? I said, I'm your man. He said, do you not want to think about it? I said, no, I'm your man. I'm coming. Just tell me when you need me. I wanted to go back and get this distillery before it fell down, you understand? Yeah. Was, and uh, he was kind of taken aback by my sudden reaction. I said, no, it's something I've been thinking about for years. If we lose this, it's going to be a tragedy. I want to take Cinderella to the ball. And Rathari was Cinderella. It was ignored by everybody. It wasn't a true Isla because it wasn't peated. So the first thing I did was made Porchala and Octomore, and that shut all the monkeys up. <coughs> if you want to peat, they'll give you a peat. Try the Octomore at 168 parts per million and see how you feel. So that's all, it, all that that's, nonsense. It seems like now, if we consider Brook Laddie, it seems like it's been around forever again, but it's not. That's as recently as... Is 2001, 2002 that they came yeah. back on stream. Yeah, which is amazing to consider now that there was a time that Brook Laddie was not only silent, but literally falling apart. We've seen the oh. photos, and I know that you've shared photos over the years. Some more drams coming in as well. Um, uh, Donald Pass Whiskey is th saying thanks for coming, Jim. Uh, so glad, uh, uh, so glad you love the classic Laddie. Me too. Uh, Tim, thanks very much. Donald Pass Whiskey. Glenn Anderson in, in Norway as well is saying, ask him what type of wine cask they use in PC10. And uh, Glenis Reagan, no comment from Glenis, but she's bought me a virtual dram as well, a generous dram from Glenis. Thank you very much. Do you know a Glenis Reagan? I've heard the name, yeah. Right, okay. So it's a new name to me, Glenis, but you're very welcome in here. Yeah. Um, and uh, Glenn Anderson's obviously putting you in the spot there. What kind of wine cask are you using in the standard PC10? Well, do you think I'm going to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Is it Pope Catholic? I mean, come on. <clears throat> you have no chance of knowing that. <clears throat> I think even even if you go back and through the transparency things at Brook Gladdy, you wouldn't necessarily find out the wine cask, right? Well, you're, the fact of the matter is, and what you should know, you are not allowed to use the name of the wine producer because yeah. that can be detrimental to the wine. Do you understand? Yep. That's quite easy to understand. We're just glad to get them, but if you, you just, it's against the law, <coughs> really, uh, to do you that. You can talk about the style of wine. You can maybe yeah, talk about the region, wine or the but you can't or mention or the chateau and, and, and the brand. Yep. Brand. You could, you know, yep. Just say it's a Saturn or whatever it may be. That would not be fair on a wine producer at all. If you're producing crap whiskey and you put it into his cask with his name on it, do you think he's going to be happy? No chance. So there you go, Glenn, straight from the horse's mouth. Unfortunately, it's a no this time. So Eleanor has bought a dram as well and saying, enjoying a dram of Brookladdy, micro provenance. This is the Reef mm. Salt cask and it's Slancha. Slancha's Eleanor, thank you very much for your dram. And Hoyt Hempel is saying, could listen to Jim's stories all day. Oh my goodness. Tim McKenzie's bought a dram to say, when it comes to casks, whether they're wine, sherry or port, does tasting the original liquid figure into the cask choice? And Graham Fraser is saying, can't imagine an Isla visit without a gym tasting. Yeah, have a great retirement, but I hope to hear from you Thank in some you. capacity in the future. Now, Graham Fraser has actually been uh, along to your, uh, he was talking about that uh, in a chat that we had earlier on. He's actually been and enjoyed your tastings firsthand. But Tim McKenzie is asking there, you know, does the spirit itself have any bearing on the cat on the choice of cask, or is there a, a certain amount of experimentation there? Well, certainly the spirit has an effect on the cask, and the cask has an effect on the spirit. It's a harmony thing, you know. And if it's a heavy peated, it's going to have a different reaction from a non peated one as well because all the phenolics in there. So, you know, you can't say that. Uh, a Milton Duff can into a Chateau Chem is going to be better than a Milton Duff can into a Latour. I mean, that would be nonsense. You just don't know. It just as examples. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's totally different. Um, but wine casts are here to stay, and thank God for it, because there's, a, 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 there's such a, a global audience now. There's just not enough sherry casts to go around. When I asked you the question earlier, when did you last buy a bottle of sherry? And you said 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, whereas you're buying wine every Friday at your local off-license, aren't you? That's so right. the wine casks, 
you know, the wine casks are there to stay, and the flavours they bring are absolutely great because the selection is fantastic. Absolutely, and I think that we're grateful that we're enjoying uh, a parallel bourbon boom. Oh well. yeah, we're, we're getting the, the good quality bourbon casks as well. And um, we talk, we're, we're talking about uh, stories here. I, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to maybe spring something on you a wee bit here because there's been a couple of folk talking about listening to your stories, the, the evangelism thing that you do. I've got a wee example, Jim. We can take a, bre- a break and a bit of a breather in the background of a wee glass of water or something. But there's a two, two and a half minute video I want to share here. Jim, when we were talking about setting this up and you, you phoned me and you called me a couple of times on the phone, I was very aware of the time I was taking, but I just wanted to listen to your words. The reason was, as I talked about at the start of the show, the passion, the energy, the enthusiasm you bring for the thing that we love. And what another thing is that you've been able to be put in front of people that are a wee bit reluctant or they're new, they're just coming in, they're maybe vaguely curious or maybe not curious at all. And you've been confronted with these people in the past. And I'm researching you and I'm going through things in the build up to this this week. And I found a video that you touched on when we spoke and I said, I have to share that on Thursday night. So can I share this wee two minute video when you welcomed Oz Clark and James May to Brook Laddie? There's a great video online on the Brook Laddie YouTube channel. You can watch the whole show. I've just selected the bit where Jim evangelizes James May, who's not a whiskey drinker, and watch what he's able to do to somebody who's declared that he does not like whiskey. Let's enjoy this wee, this wee clip, Jim. Try it. Yeah, right. Have a little taste Here of that. Here we go. Go, man, you can do this. It's a whiskey moment. Oh, just hold it there. Now that's young. It's powerful. It's like you when you were 21. You're a rock star. I mean, look at you now. <laughs> You're even more of a rock star, you know? You're more mellow and mature. It's hot. Mm. Behind you, in that very small barrel, is the famous X4. What is X4? X4 is just a code name we use to say that this whiskey has been distilled four times. Mm. When it was first made in 1695, the holy man who made it said, if you take one teaspoonful, you live forever. Two teaspoonfuls, you go blind. (laughs) And three, you just, your heart stops. So, would you like to take that chance? Yes. So this will either make me immortal or dead. Three, two, one. Look him in the eyes. That's remarkable. Wow. It's remarkable you can speak of. That is that exceptional, exceptionally exciting whiskey drink experience, and you're still an ugly bastard. <laughs> <Incredible. laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> and that's the stuff you had in the car. <laughs> See, whiskey normally takes me to a very, frankly, dark place. For the what, cupboard? Right, that's no, it's, you know, as soon as I smell whiskey, and certainly as soon as I taste it, I, it's the world closing in slightly until I'm in a... I suppose what in Scotland would be like a windowless bothy on a dark night with the rain outside. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a last refuge, mm. you know. And beyond that, there is all hope is lost, and that's where whiskey is. And it will either take you into the abyss or it will release you mm. from it. But with this one, you, it's, it's like one of those moments of great clarity of thought. You put it on your tongue, and there's a moment when you see all the Jesus light coming through the sky and the clouds parting and, and the, the rain lifting and all those things. And it's very brief and then it's, it's gone again, mm. but it's there. Because at the bottom of Pandora's box lay hope. Exactly. If you dared to open it. <laughs> ah, James, you're still an ugly bastard as well. And you still talk complete twaddle once you've had a few. But finally, whiskey has led you away from the dark place. Please, sir, could I have some more? Just a little bit. <laughs> I absolutely ah. love that clip. And I mean, Jim, that must be what fills you back full of that energy and passion. Ah, thank you so much for showing that. That was that was amazing. Yeah, it was right. Really, 
Yeah. And I, you, you, you remember, you must remember, and I'm going back, I, I watched that at the time it came on t- television. And I was early in my whiskey journey. I was only maybe three, four, five years into my whiskey journey. And I watched that and I thought, oh my, I didn't know who Jim McCune was. I didn't know who Mark was. I wasn't even that comfortable. I wasn't that um, uh, well uh, informed about Brooke Laddie. But I watched that and I thought, oh my goodness, I have to get my hands on that. Still to this day, I'm yeah. to try and explore. Yeah. But that, that what you did there, what you were able to witness, that vicarious enjoyment through whiskey, it's one of my it's one of the favorite things to experience in whiskey when somebody else feels what you have felt. That must have been rewarding when you were out there on the road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a terrific trip because I told you the story about the racing car and then you yes. spit it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what a couple of heroes they were. I mean, they were complete rock and roll. Um uh, <clears throat> And when we filled out the racing car up with a new spirit, and we got this the stretch of road between Ruthladi and the big strand, and the priest got all the sheep off there, and, and <clears throat> I'm pouring out a jerry can new spirit, seventy two point five into the racing car, which was exactly after they had that dram, so they would drink driving. You understand? Oh dear. <laughs> oh yeah, but there's no sheep on the road, and the priest has it was a closed there. road. <laughs> If the police had known, and then they got into the car, uh, just to prove that alcohol could possibly be better than petrol or diesel. And this car took off like a rocket, I'm telling you. And the vapour was phenomenal. It was like a nosing, you know. It was just, the, the smell coming out of that car was like, oh, I believe I can fly. This is just, I just want to hear this stuff. All up and down uh, the road and all, all over Isla. I have oh, to say, anybody who's interested, um, I'll actually put a, a link in the description after tonight and a link to that clip on the Brook Laddie YouTube channel as well, and you can watch the whole thing start to finish. It's, it's really good. You can see the racing car. You can see the guys driving it and things like that as well, powered by the new make X4 Spirit. And Gerben Blocker has uh, bought, me, bought us a dram gym to say thanks for a really special event. And what a clip. Absolutely. I, I had oh, to share that, was, that one. That's made my whole year, seeing that again. I haven't seen it for a long, long time. Oh, uh, aye. It's, it's sensational. It, it's one of my favourite things because you gave him the Port Charlotte there and or I, was it Port Charlotte? I'm not sure. It was a 10-year-old or something. And he just kind of responded by saying, no, this is hot. This is hot. And you didn't stop. You said, aye, okay. You think hot, okay. Over your shoulder there, there's this. And then you can transform. You, it, literally, he says to you, you've taken me away from the dark place that he thought yeah. whiskey was. Just just a, a wonderful thing to witness. Yeah. Great and and I've, I've, I've witnessed you doing that to roomfuls of people on video. I've never been in a live gym tasting, unfortunately. But I've witnessed you do that to roomfuls of people as well. And I think that um, all the years that you talk about being on the road, being traveling, whether it was at Bemore or Brook Laddie, um, there must be some satisfaction in it, Jim. Uh, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it was a great privilege to be able to represent my country because I truly love Scotland. I mean, I would die for Scotland. It's as simple as that. If the bugle sounded, I would be there because I just totally believe in this this country of ours. Uh, and yeah, there's been some some very very emotional moments. Uh, I think I told you a story of the wee Japanese girl with the Wellingtons. Uh, no, but I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I was managing Bumore at the time, <clears throat> and as you know, we were owned by Santori. And uh, I was <clears throat> heading up the road to get my kids to go to school, and it was absolutely pissing down. The rain was just coming down in sheets. And as I came out the distillery gates to go up to the house, which is about a mile out of the town, I noticed this... <clears throat> small, very small Japanese girl and the rain's lashing down and she doesn't have a coat on and she's got a pair of trainers, right? So I stop my car. She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't, I could be, you know, you know, a, a rapist or a mother or whatever. And um, I said, where are you going? And she, she said, I'm going to distillery, distillery. I said, yeah, I'll take you, jump in. But she must have thought I was trying to abduct her. You know, she would not get into the car. 
So I got out of the car and I walked her into the distillery, but this time she's completely saturated. And I said to Christine <coughs> Logan, who was in charge of the reception, I said, look after this kid, will you? Get a pair of wellies from the local shop, get her some, uh, <coughs> a waterproof coat, dry clothes, get her sorted out, give her some coffee and all that sort of stuff. And uh, look after her. And uh must have been at least 10 years later, uh, I think I was in Yokohama at the time, <clears throat> and this girl, remember, I've got all these yellow Wellingtons, I've got the coat and all that stuff, yeah. and this little girl who had grown up somewhat, she came up to me just before the tasting, and she held up this pair of Wellingtons, yellow Wellingtons. And I'm thinking, this is strange. Why is this woman holding up yellow Wellingtons? And she said, Jim San, do you remember me? I said, no, I'm really I'm sorry. I, I meet a lot of people and my memory's not good because I drink a lot of alcohol. Um, and uh, she said, do you remember the little Japanese girl who you took to distillery? I said, was that you? He said, Jim, that was me. And I still have the rubber boots. I believed. When, when you left, I never got a chance to say thank you to me for getting me the clothes and getting me the yellow Wellingtons. She said, and I prayed many, many times that I would get a chance to meet you to say thank you for buying me the yellow Wellingtons. Man, tears were running. I was hugging her and she was hugging me. After all that time, that's what you call faith. She waited, I think it was eight years or something like that, hoping to meet me to say thank you for the Wellingtons. And this is you in Yokohama. Hi. That's incredible. That's incredible. And I bet you if she could go back in time now, if she's going to want anybody to save her from the pouring rain and take her to the distillery, it's going to, she's going to want it to be Jim McEwen. And obviously she yeah. just didn't know that that was you back in the day. That was it, was one of these, it, was one of, it was one of these moments when... She's standing there, I'm about to do a tasting, and it's this beautiful young woman now, and she's holding up the other wellies. I cried, and she cried. And then we had a dram together, and we hugged each other, and it was like, wow. There's such a thing as destiny. If you don't believe in it, start drinking whiskey, because it takes you places nowhere, no, no other drink will take you there. It's just phenomenal. I have to I say, I agree with you fully, Jim. And I, I, I feel... Often the same that this, um, even doing what I do here, has had me uh, fighting back tears over the years and things like that. I think it's a brilliant thing for connecting people that otherwise would have no business even meeting each other. And suddenly they become fast friends over a glass of whiskey. And it does bring on the sentiment and it does bring in the emotion, but it's positive and it's grateful yeah. emotion, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I could but I, I, I've actually just completed my own autobiography. Did you know that? Tell us about it. Yeah, it's called The Journeyman's Journey. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a, it's now on sale in Germany. And it's selling really, really well. It's a story of my life. And uh, the English translation will be happening, I think, maybe in a couple of months' time. So The Journeyman's Journey is just the story of my life. And there's a lot of emotional moments in there. You know, and I, I found it when I was writing the book, I, I found myself the tears running down when I was recalling, like, old Mr. Bell leaving me his tools in the secret place so I would always have a penny in my pocket. You know, I told you that story. You know, it's, it's actually written on my notes here, Jim, and all I wanted to do, I, I've heard this story, but lots of people tuning in tonight, such as the ones that are, that are buying the drams. I'll, I'll, I'll mention these. Shayla is saying, Brugladi was my epiphany whiskey laddie from 2015. That is Jim's signature on the side. I bought another bottle of the exact same whiskey, 15 slash 113, a gem. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you so much. Glenis okay. Regan is in again, and she's meant, she's commented this thing. Jim will miss you as much as we will miss you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Jim, Will you miss us as much as we will miss you? Sorry, Glennis. Um, she's asking if you're going to miss her too. Uh, thank you for uh, making the whiskey journey such an exceptional experience. How lucky we all are. Um, and I'm worried, yeah. I'm worried that I've missed somebody. Yes, I've, I've almost missed Gavin as well. Gavin Meeks has said, Jim, seeing you in the golden... Uh, 
dream or golden dram, depending on where you are, documentary, made me get out and try Scotch whiskey. Wow. Uh, cheers to your wonderful career. Looking forward to seeing your efforts from Arnaho. Roy, thanks for hosting, Gavin. Thank you so, so much. Jim, I know about I know about what David Bell meant to you. I know how much of a mentor he was, but tell us about The Secret Place. It's a great story. I think I told you that story, didn't I? You didn't tell me, but I have I have heard the story, but this is the first I'll hear it from you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my teacher, as a Cooper, uh, was called David Bell, and he came from a place called Aberfoyle, not far from Glasgow. And he had moved to Beaumont. He fought in the First World War. Uh, he was in the HLI, which was a Glasgow uh, battalion, the Highland Light Infantry, and he survived the trenches in France, which is incredible. You think of the bloodshed and the Holocaust that was France. And uh, he found himself, he was a Cooper, a train Cooper. He was the number one in Scotland when I met him, the longest serving, made him number one. And um, he became like a, a a father to me. You know, he was like, he was so good. He was a church going man. He didn't drink, but he didn't stop him stealing whiskey. That was good. He was good at stealing whiskey. I mean, he's a, a Christian that doesn't drink, but he steals whiskey. You understand? That's really cool. Uh, and he, he would use that whiskey and they'd give it to a farmer, and the farmer would give him a bag of tatties or, you know, stuff like that. Or, uh, he was just a great, great guy, and um, it was a great pleasure to to be his apprentice. And uh, I was in Glasgow blending at the time, and I got a phone call from my mother <clears throat> to say that my hero, David Bell, who had been my teacher, World War One veteran, survived the gas, survived the trenches, and every Christmas <clears throat> when I was his apprentice, he would give me a gift on Christmas Eve. He would take out his pocket watch, take the back off his pocket watch, and inside that was a 10 shilling note, which is today's value of 50 pence. And he would give me this 10 shilling note. And he'd put the, the back on his watch and he'd say, buy a wee present for yourself, son. 10 shillings, right? So that's how close we were. <clears throat> anyway, I was working in Glasgow, blending, and I got a phone call um, <clears throat> to say that he was not expected to live much longer. So I decided I'm going to jump in the first plane. There only is two planes a day. So I got on the evening flight, went over to Beaumont, this little house, and all the family had gathered around, the big family. They all gathered around in this small house. And uh, so I got into the house and I <clears throat> met the family and shaking hands with them and all that. And I said, how is my old pal? And his son, Alan, said, he's not going to last long, Jim. He'd be lucky if he gets through tonight. And I'm like shattered because this man taught me everything, not just about coopery, about decency and honesty and doing your best at all times. He was the old school. Do it once and do it right. That was the way it was. So they're all gathered in this tiny house, and his son said, would you like to say <clears throat> A goodbye to dad. I said, yeah, I'd like to speak to that. I hope it's not a goodbye. I just want to see him, you know. So I went down to his bedroom, which was a very small bedroom, and there he was. He had shrunk. He was <clears throat> very, very frail, not expected to last. And he was a very frugal man, remember that? He didn't waste anything. So I went down to see him, and he, he kind of came to a little bit, and he looked at me, and he said, ah, Jim. It's you, son. Thanks for coming to see me. He said, I'm leaving tonight. And I said, no, Davy, you're not leaving tonight. I need you to come and build some more bars with me. I'm trying to be brave for him and brave for me because my heart is breaking, you know. This is my hero, <clears throat> 90 years of age. So I said, no, David, <clears throat> we're going to make cash together tomorrow. He said, Jim, shh. I have a secret for you. And I said, okay, what's the secret? He said, I have left a gift for you that will make sure that you will always have a penny in your pocket. And the gift I leave you is in a secret place. 
I knew where the secret place was. And I said, ah, oh, David, don't even talk about it. I'll see you in the morning. And I said my goodbyes to him. And the sheer and certain knowledge, I would never see the man who gave me everything in terms of education and coopering and all that. And a great friend, much, much older than me. And uh, so he, he duly passed away that night. And uh, <clears throat> it was a big funeral because he was well known throughout the island. You know, Coopers are very, very rare. He was, there's only about two Coopers on the island. And he was the number one in Scotland. And so after the funeral, I went to the house for a cup of tea and the place was packed. It was a small house. And I spoke to his son, David, and I offered my condolences, obviously. And I said, um, David, your dad said he left me a special gift that would make sure I would I have a penny in my pocket. And the gift is in the secret place. And I know where the secret place is. And the son said, I don't know what it is. I said, no, you don't know what it is, but I know what it is. He said, well, show me where it is. <clears throat> so I took him out to Davy's old Davy's garden shed. It was full of rakes and spades and all the stuff that an old guy has, a gardener. And he had a little trap door <clears throat> on the floor. And when there had been a knot in the wood, you could put your finger in and pull up the trap door, right? And I was about that depth you know, between the floor. And I'm thinking, he's, he's left me a few bottles of the good stuff. I was convinced he had left me a few bottles of 1964, all of those are sherry, all of those are sherry from number one vaults, something like that. I was sure of it. Uh, and pulled it up. And there was the gift that would make sure I always had a penny in my pocket. What he had done while he was still fit you're taking all his tools that a Cooper needs, all the ads and the, and the head knives and everything that Cooper needs to make a barrel. And he has sharpened them to razor sharp, wrapped them all up in hessian sackcloth with oil. That was the gift. As long as I had tools, I would I hear a penny in my pocket. I gave that gift to Beaumont Distillery and I truly regret it. I should have kept it. For myself, it was really, really personal. But what a great gift to be left! You would always have a penny in your pocket. Incredible. It is incredible, so I, Jim. It's incredible, and I can tell as you're telling that story as well how how much it means to you, the sentiment and the emotion. And I think yeah. that what you have to recognise, Jim, that there are folk out there that feel the same way about you. You've mentored people. People that's worked for you, people that's worked along, alongside you, but there are literally people in this audience, this lounge tonight, that ha that blame you for their whiskey journey. And I think that that's um, so an yet another gift that whiskey is capable of giving. I think fantastic story, Jim. I'll raise a wee glass to David Bell. I've just I've just done that. So that was to David Bell. Yeah, but there's a lot of heroes as well, uh, but. He, he was he was up there, you understand. To have survived the trenches in France, yeah, and, and all that sort of stuff. He lived in his nineties. Yeah, fantastic guy. So there's people. I was lucky to be apprentice for him because he taught me more than just making bows. He taught me to be a good guy. You understand? Not a tear yes, away. Yes, yes. He was a hard taskmaster, and in a small village like Bromore, he knows what's happening. And that sort of stuff. So he became a kind of more more than a mentor. He was he took a personal interest in me, and I was reciprocated. You know, I thought he was a hero, just a humble Cooper from Aberfoyle who ended up in Isla. And uh, I have visited his grave occasionally, but I should do it more often. But how clever was that? Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 meaningful as well. You know. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you would have been grateful with the, the bottles of whiskey, but to have something of, of that, yeah. it's great. And is it stories like that that's going to be in this book, Jim? Yeah, yeah. I remember the time we were the number one warehouse, <clears throat> and uh, we were hoisting casks. There's three floors of number one warehouse, the famous number yep. one bolts yes. and all that. So Davy was up the top working as a, a, 
a, a small winch. You would winch the cask. You'd put two hogsheads on, put the chains around them, put the hook on. He would push the button, and the cask would go up from floor to floor to floor to floor. Okay, and then when they got to the top floor, they'd have a, a chain on it and pull it in, and then we stack the barrels there. I was on the ground floor. I was putting the chains on the barrels, and standing beside me is a customs officer. At that time, there was customs officers in East East Italy, plus they had guards called watchers, because they were watching everything you were doing. They were there to stop you stealing whiskey. They had a snowball's chance in hell. There was no bloody way. Yeah. So anyway, I'm standing down below. Beside me is a customs officer with a uniform on. And upstairs <clears throat> is old lady working the crane. And the, the, the chains go on and the two the two barrels <coughs> are stuck. I say to Davy, okay, Davy, hoist away. I'm shouting up to him. Okay, Davy, take the strain, man. And he leans over. And what do I see? I see a half bottle coming screaming down from three floors up of stolen whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> he had put the bottle inside the top of his apron. And because he was deaf... He was saying, are you all right, Jim? And I'm shouting, aye, but he can't hear me. So he leans forward too much. And suddenly I see this half bottle of Johnny Walker coming down about 60 miles an hour. It's coming too fast for me to catch. And the customs officer are standing right close to me. Yeah. And the bottle hits the barrel, smashes, and the cork flies out. Okay? Yeah. The customs man just about has a canary, right? He's just about to <laughs> Davey was down about two seconds behind the bottle and he's kicking the glass away and he says to me, Jim, you see these bloody light bulbs? They're no lasting any time at all. <laughs> the first time I saw an electric light bulb with a cork in it. <laughs> the customs man just shook his head. He says, oh, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. <laughs> And Johnny Walker half bottle of it. Oh. These bloody light bulbs. They're no lasting any time at all. <laughs> Graham Young is in Canada saying thank you for the story, Roy, and for the guest. Uh, the ever reverend Mr. Jim McEwen, a true <laughs> pair of whiskey eagles. Graham, thank you, thank you so much. Um uh, Alistair Gray is doing a very good job as well. a uh, moderator, he's dropped in. Uh, the link for uh, Jim's book. It's jimsbiography.com. Uh, it's 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 written by Udo Sontag, so it's written in uh, for a German audience. It's in the German language right now, but as Jim's already mentioned, uh, there's an English translation, an English version uh, coming out soon. So I think that must be available for pre-order then, is it? I'm not exactly sure. I've got nothing to do with the distribution. I just wrote the story, but I know it's, it's, the translation's happening just now. Right. And it should be available soon. And it's just full of stories. And some of them are well, so bizarre. You would never we've got, we've got Greg in the background as well, and I'm, I'm going to bring in Greg a wee bit later. Um, Greg's dropped in. Greg Schwartz, who's be, been involved in this collaboration with you. Greg was on uh, the VPUB uh, a few months back to talk about the Water Life film. Um, and uh, he'll come on a wee bit later, and he can fill us in uh, with details on the events and things like that. But... I think you're doing your your final final event at the end of this month, Jim, aren't you? You're doing your, you've got a tasting and then you've got a showing and a chat uh, alongside the showing of this, the movie that, that Greg um, has been involved in, the, the Water of Life film, and at the end of May, and that's that's it. You're, you're literally calling it the last chat. Yeah, yeah. It's funny when you get to this age of life, you know, uh, and you look back at so many memories. And a whiskey game is a hard game to be in. And it's whiskey's a good friend and a bad enemy. You've got to treat it with total respect, as you know. I've seen too many folk falling down and um, lives ruined because of it. But that's the same with any alcohol. That's not exclusive to whiskey. Sure. It can be wine, it can be gin, it can be cocaine, whatever you want to do. But I have to say that um, in all my time in, in the blending plants in Glasgow, traveling the world and all that sort of stuff, there's a reverence about, you're talking about reverence, there's a reverence about single malt, all single malt. It's really, people really do appreciate the quality and the effort that the Scots put into making this drink. There's a pride in it. We're all so proud of 
Why did God choose us? Why did he give us whiskey? I know why he gave it to us, because he knew that we would look after it. It's in our very nature to look after things as Scots. I think that's why we got it, you know, um, to look after. We certainly weren't the first people to distill, but I'm talking about whiskey here. I mean, the, the Egyptians done it hundreds of years before that. Uh, but it's, we've been so blessed with whiskey and and the quality, as I said earlier, has never, ever been better. Uh, it's changed a lot. It's a lot of computers in there now, and that's just modern. It's like when you go to hospital, you've got all the machines there, right? Yeah. An accident. It's the same with everything's moved on. But the quality has never, ever diminished, and that's down to the cast. The distillation bit's the easy bit. There's quality cast and keep your eye on it. And as a cooper, I really do appreciate that as well because the cooper industry at one time might have gone into demise, you know. Um, but no, it's the system. It's great. But it's a good position. I want, I want to pick up. I want to pick up on that Cooper thing that you mentioned there. Daniel Williams has bought us a dram, um, and saying any way of getting a signed copy of the book. I don't know about that, Daniel. You might need to. You might need to stock Jim on Isla. Yeah, well, <laughs> what, yeah. what, what was the gentleman's name? Daniel Williams. Daniel Williams. You can certainly get my signature. But you're going to have to come and visit the Holy Land. There you go, Daniel. Get on, you have get to on do. that ferry. Get on the ferry, man, and come over. Visit the distilleries. The food's magic in Isla. We've got great food. The people are so friendly. Great distilleries. Very little traffic. Three policemen. I mean, they couldn't be better. You know, I mean, it's just the beaches go forever. We've got beaches Absolutely. that go for six miles. There's hills to climb. The scenery is great. The next stop is America and Canada to the west. You can see some of the biggest waves in the world. So please come over. I'll be happy to sign your book or sign your shirt or sign your body or sign anything. Just take yourself <laughs> over here. This there you go, Daniel. Life. There you go. All you have to do is make a pilgrimage. McAllen Fine and Rare is suggesting that the English version is available from May 15th as well. Um, and Jim is not... Uh, over-egging things. He's not gilding the lily. I took my kids and my wife to Isla. Now, I'd been to Isla many, many times for whiskey things before. First time we went as a family, and I was nervous that they would think, oh, this is daddy's whiskey place. But the kids, not only did they love it, but they are campaigning us to get back there again. Great. They they fell in love with Mahir Bay, watching the sunsets, oh. falling over into the freezing cold sea, Um, they just absolutely loved it. And I agree with you fully on the food as well, Jim. It's it's fabulous. Oh, it's wonderful. fabulous. So there you go. And Daniel is saying, I, I'll take you up on that one. <laughs> so I, like I think Daniel's actually a German, despite the name. Uh, he's, he, I think he's out in Germany. Daniel, I apologize if I made a mistake, but I, I feel like you're, a Ger uh, you're in Germany. Um, you'll need to uh, go over and, and uh, track down Jim. Jim, I'll get back to the Coopering thing. And one, uh, this is a Jim McEwen comment I'm going to mention now. There's a kind of mini manifesto that I talk about on the channel regularly, and it's it's okay for us to understand w where Scotch came from, the blend legacy, let's say 40% presentation. Um, you know, chill filtration is part of that at that strength. Uh, in order to keep consistency, there's colouring permitted because we've, the, the, pack, the days of Paxarette and other ways of doing that is, are gone. Yeah, we understand all of that. But I think malt is a precious thing. And I, I wish that we wouldn't add things to malt and I wish that we wouldn't take things away. And I know that you feel the same, but you had an amazing, you made an amazing point that I'd never even considered before. That if adding colouring to malt whiskey could potentially threaten a trade. Coopering. Mm. I never considered that. So that must be you yeah. speaking as a cooper and yeah, thinking yeah. about if we try if we replace Active well, yeah. casks with, with artificial colouring. I mean, I don't want to derail this into a negative discussion. I'm really enjoying the chat. But you, as a cooper, you must have an opinion there. Yeah. The, well, it's, I'll take it a different way. I, I hear where you're coming from. But, um, and I totally, I'm dead against artificial colouring, you know, as a cooper, because you're taking jobs away from coopers. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah, it really is that simple. And uh, But not only that, you, you're not treating your customer with respect. I mean, the customer, the mo it's all about education. Uh, <clears throat> the modern single malt 
consumer understands the whole thing. You know, at one time, people used to judge the quality of the whiskey by looking through the bottle, and if it looked kind of dark, it was good. It could have been three years and one day, but it looked good. So by removing the colour, you're getting an, <clears throat> an honest impression of the cask in which it was matured. And that's the key that unlocks the door to the flavour. If you can't see the natural colour, you don't know what you're getting. And as you know, it's caramel colouring. What's caramel? Sugar. Yep. You understand? You've just spent all this time converting sugar into alcohol. And guess what you're going to add to it? Sugar. Sugar. What's the point? The consumer now has got more education than what people think. They're educated now because of shows like yours and work that I was doing and a hundred other ambassadors. Uh, and the education level is higher now and more and more people are getting use casks. <clears throat> now, I can tell you that on camera, that that's darker than it actually is in real life. This is as pale as Chardonnay. This is a, this is a Speyside whiskey. This is from Great. Speyside. That's Chardonnay. fantastic. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and we, as more aficionados, as malt enthusiasts, we can be excited mm. about a pale whiskey because we are completely drawn in by flavour and texture yeah. and the experience. But like you say, Jim, it does take education. And I think that the industry now need to kind of step up a wee bit and say, okay, there's a, there's a place for this and a, a market for that. But when it comes to malt, malt whiskey, I think I genuinely think it's a precious gift. You've talked tonight about how you you believe that it was a, a well, gift happened. from God. I mean, this is a precious thing, and we are we are guardians of something very precious. And it won't it won't take much for the other world the, the other world whiskies that are coming out now, which is a boom right across the globe. And they decide no, we're going to do it all natural because the Scots don't. That's not that's not a good PR look. I don't think. Yeah, um, I, I think the well, I know for a fact that most good single malts today are not coloured. I agree. Blended, blended whiskey, well, is coloured because it's yeah. a mix. -out. It doesn't matter the artificial colourings in there because you're going to add Coca Cola to it, or you're going yeah. to add ginger to it, or you're going to add lemonade to it, or some other shit like that. Yeah. Whereas, <clears throat> virtually, I would say, I don't know, maybe eighty percent of the single malts available now are not artificially coloured. I would say with certainty that that's the case. I go through duty free quite a lot and I look at it. There's a few out there that are still, you can tell by the colour, it's unnatural. It's like suntan lotion. You know what I mean? Yep. That didn't yes. come from the past. So as a single malt drinker, you can spot them because you look at bottles of whiskey. We as connoisseurs, we look at bottles and we taste this and we can spot the ringer right away. That colour is not natural. That didn't come from oak, you understand? So the situation is much, much improved. The message is getting through to the consumer. The distillers were using colour as the attraction. Now, the non-use of colour is the attraction. It's gone completely the opposite way. People are asking, is that, that colour can't be right? You have a look at it and think, shit, that can't be right. It's like some yeah. time motion, you know what I mean? So... That, the door is opening really, really wide. So I'm sure there'll be less and less single malts being artificially coloured. I think it's almost over. And blends should do the same. But having said that, you can add Coca-Cola to a blend or lemonade or ginger ale and all that sort of stuff. If it makes it look, and there's a lot of grain whiskey in there, as you know, some blend. I remember doing a blend for, I think it was Taiwan. It was 97.5 grain and 2.5 malt. And there was two malts. I mean, yeah. get real. Yeah. And it was, it was as dark as you couldn't believe it. It was almost like Coca-Cola. And it was called Glen McTavish, distilled by Blind Virgins on a Tuesday morning and Ben a he or some shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean this this would have been this would have been a contract product for a price point. This would have been a price yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. We want it to be this colour and we want it to fit this price. So then you're forced into that well, it has to be mostly grain. But only going to be able to throw in a couple of Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I think we're moving steady. The progress is steady. The single malt guys, there's more and more folk coming into category. There's a younger audience coming in. There's shows like yours. There's no lack of education. 25 years ago, you thought a, a nice colour whiskey was a good whiskey. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's right. Uh, 
I mean, some light coloured whiskies are absolutely just delicious, you know. You know, it depends very much on the car. So we're we're moving in the right direction and we're moving fast. I'm really, really happy that E150 is going to be banned. You know, if you, if you handed somebody a spoonful of sugar and said, have this before you drink your dram, what do you think the answer would be? Right. Beat it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in the right, we're going the right way. I hope so, Jim. I hope so. I've no, got another couple of questions here from, from patrons and I, I, I want to be, I'm, I, I realise that I want to kind of give these guys their opportunity to, this is the, the best chance they're going to have to get their questions across to you. Um, but two of three of them have come along with very, very similar questions here. Menno in Belgium has, has asked, the current interest in whiskey is unprecedented. How bright is the future of whiskey? Are there possible threats? Which is very similar to Frank in the Netherlands, uh, Pete Head, who's in tonight as well. Some questions spring to mind. Whiskey booms like never before. So it might seem there is only sunshine in the future, says Frank. But is it? What risks? Or dark clouds does Jim see? And it's kind of on the same theme as our friend in Canada, Blair Conrad, who thinks, um, could you please ask him if anything could happen with whiskey in the future that would make him the happiest? So, so you know, we've touched on the positivity, the direction, the younger audience, the more education, the better quality, more consistency, more ca better casks, all of these things, more variety. Um, what risks do you see on the horizon? And what would make you happy in order to kind of um, maximise Scot uh, Scotch's potential in the future? Certainly, uh, from a political point of view, the duty in whisky is just shocking, you know? The amount of duty the government has taken on whisky is just incredible. And they put nothing back into it. I mean, that is a fact. I mean, it's, how can you travel through international airports and you buy your whisky cheaper than you can buy it in the place where it was made? I mean, that is just not right. I mean, that's criminal. You can buy litre bottles of Glen, whatever you want, at half the price you'd pay for in a store back home in Scotland. And that's a problem the government... They're quite happy taking the duty. The government love it. They give nothing towards the distillers in any shape or form, apart from legislation telling you what you can and cannot do. Yeah. So that's got to be looked at. The government's got to sort itself out and show some appreciation. The price, the tax on whiskey is prohibitive they're making a fortune you know so the, and who's who's the loser the customer is the loser he's paying vast amount of money for whiskey it doesn't cost that much to make or store it for 10 years but <clears throat> this duty bloody thing is absolutely ridiculous uh, and it's going to go on but because the demand for single malt and indeed blends the distillers are ramped up if you look at the production now in scotland and years before it's phenomenal, man. These yeah. stories have multiplied their capacity beyond their wildest dreams. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and not all whiskies are sell a lot of single malts. A lot of whiskies are made specifically for blending. If you've got a yeah. big pair of company and you've got a dozen distilleries, you've got six at the top, and they're your, your banner carriers, and then the yeah. other ones are used in the blend. It doesn't mean the other ones are not great whiskies, but they're going to be used in blends. So I don't see a problem at all. And, and in fact, as you know, there's more whiskies that were once used for blends are now available as single malts, which is brilliant. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. But the capacity of the distillers has increased dramatically. I mean, there's big, big plants now. I mean, absolutely incredible. And there is a place for blends. Green whiskey is good. You think you would, when people talk about green whiskey, you think they were talking about something that wasn't good. It's absolutely phenomenal. Green yeah. whiskey is beautiful. It's a well distilled product. It's made from a cereal. It's matured in oak. It's perfect. Uh, when I've made, I remember making a blend for, I think it was for Taiwan. And I was using 97.5% grain and 2.5% malts. And of that was about six malts. It was absolutely delicious. The grain was so good, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. And as I started out tonight, I started out with a, a grain whiskey, the Tweeddale. Um, it's naturally presented as well. It says natural colour. It says natural filter. It's out there at 46%. Um, and it's it's delicious. I'm, I'm often stopped in my tracks just how good a whiskey it can ah, be. Smooth, you know? Malt is, uh, um, you could spend all your time chasing the variety that's out there in malt right now. It's Right now it's endless. It's really endless. It's difficult to, to even keep up with 
with new releases, with new distilleries even, increases, as you touch upon, Jim, increases in capacity of the existing distilleries as well. So as, as, the, as these guys asking the questions quite rightly point out, it seems to be, you know, sunshine in the future, as Frank was talking about there. Um, so you see the threats as being overtaxation. Um, oh, you see sure. it, that probably that would be affecting exports as well, uh, punitive tariffs and things like that. Um, no, I'll just, I'm just going to interrupt you there. I see that. Go the, ahead. I can assure you that you've gone through duty free in any lots of airports. You're a well travelled man. The number of times I've gone through duty free, and I'm looking at some of the prices that have been charged in duty free. You would think the duty free the price would be lower, it's actually higher. You know what I mean? It's just, it's out of control. Yep. Yep. The packaging is really good because it's designed specifically for the international travellers, and the price is ridiculous. The quality is not in the product, it's in the packaging, the fancy bottles and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, but it's, it is what it is, and it's got to change. The duty has to be reduced. The capacity in, in the Scottish distilleries of production has quadrupled in the last 20 years. It quadrupled. It's just incredible. You've got huge plants that are running 24 uh, 7, pumping out most of it's going into blends. Yep, 12, 15, 20 million litre capacities. And we're not talking about grain distilleries, we're talking about malt distilleries. It is incredible. Let's get back to Jim. Simon Ray's asking, in terms of questions, I'd be interested to know what Jim thinks is the most important, valuable thing he's learned during his whiskey journey. Wow, shit, that's a hard one. It is. <laughs> um, I would say um, I'm moving away from the distilling side of it and I'm going more on a personal side of it, got something in my eye here. For me, the most important thing when I was traveling all the time, and I was doing 40 weeks a year, uh, and it was uh, the welcome I got. And, and uh, you know, you're Jim from Scotland. The very word Scotland, just people, uh, where are you from? I'm from Jim, I'm from Scotland. How are you doing? I'm doing your tasting tonight. The accent, the whole, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's just something rather special about Scotland. And uh, people buy into the programme because there's an honesty and sincerity associated with Scottish people. I mean, we're the greatest bankers in the world. You know, we've, you know, we've created banking. And people believe in Scotland. They believe in Scottish people. We don't have a reputation of being con men or all that sort of stuff. We're regarded around the world as being the David Livingstons. You know, we are we are cherished. We are respected, and uh, that's been probably. I can I can assure that everywhere that I went, and I said, "My name is Jim McQueen. I'm from Scotland." The eyes changed. The eyes light up. I said, hey, you're from Scotland, man. God, I love your country. I've never been there, but I'm going to come. That juice that you make is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so I think it's a combination of who we are, how we behave, our personality. We're, we're quite a strange personality. We love you, we love you, we hate you, we hate you forever. That's for sure. There's no middle ground with a Scotsman. Uh, unless it's like a couple of drums. You're okay, you have talk to anybody there. But yeah, yeah. Um, what you're talking about, Jim, is the people connection again, aren't you? You're talking about that ability to connect with people, to use whiskey, to use your position as a Scot, as mm -hmm. a Scot in whiskey, traveling. The relationship, the trust is. There's not many nations in the world you would trust. But we created banking, you know what I mean? So we're all right. You can trust them. There, there's something that you do, and I've never witnessed this. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to witness it firsthand. But when you get a room full of people together, and you're kind of having this gathering, this this thing around whiskey. What you've talked about tonight, a lot of the language has been around kind of uh, spiritual things and about um, emotional and sentimental things. But you're able to stir the room with the passion, um, and you, you're able to elevate it. They're able to elevate it to something akin to a spiritual experience. And you use a, a really cool thing that you, that you have this Highland toast. 
Now, I've got a clip that I'm going to share with people tonight so that they can see what this thing is, but I want to ask you, is that a Jim McEwen thing? Is that no. come from somewhere? No. Have you, what, what, what is the Highland Toast, Jim? Uh, in the days, of, I can't remember exact dates, but it's been around since the clan wars, right? When the different clans would go to war. <clears throat> the clan chiefs from various clans would come together. Let's say they're going to battle the next day. And the McFees and the McLeans and the McNeils would all come together. <clears throat> and the, the clan chiefs would all sit around and say, okay, the McFees, you're the archers, you'll come from the left flank. And the McNeils, you'll come from the right. You've got the horses and so on. And, and they'd plan the battle for the next day. And <clears throat> once all the plans were given to the clan chiefs, they would go back to their clans and relay the strategy for the battle to come in the next week or whatever. And they'd be walking for miles over peat bogs and all that sort of stuff before they met the enemy. So the clan chiefs would have this meeting and who was, who was the most suitable, who's the best with the swords and who's the best with the axes and all that sort of stuff, who's the bravest. And then <clears throat> they would have this toast on the night before battle in the sure and certain knowledge that many of them would never see each other again. This is it. Tomorrow, tonight we drink, tomorrow we may die. And so what they would do <clears throat> at the end of the meeting of the clan chiefs, they would do the Highland Toast. <clears throat> and they would take the glass of whiskey <clears throat> and they would put one foot in a chair and one foot on a table. Or if they're on the outside, they put one foot in the ground and one foot in a rock. You know, if they're out in the box and all that sort of stuff. If you weren't out in the box, you can do it at home. If you tra practice this at home with your wife and the children, it's really, really good. I recommend it. Give the kids Coca-Cola and give the wife some water. But take a dram yourself. Um, <coughs> you put your left foot in the chair. Let me see you doing this. Come on, stand up. It's your show. Right, right. I'll need to Let's put the seat down a wee bit, will we? There we go. Right. Right, here Let's we go. Let's the chair, right foot in the table. Right, here we go. Is that a, a right foot in the table? Oh, Christ, Jim. You want me to get up in the sky? I am. <laughs> right. Are you a man or a mouse? Are you a warrior? <clears throat> right, here goes. You never thought it was going to be this good, did you? Right. <laughs> Guys, get ready. He's going to fly off his chair. Get ready. Right, I, exactly. And I'm, I'm going to wake up the kids as well, I imagine. Right, there we go. I'm, I'm up on a table and I've got a foot. Right. The glass <laughs> in your right hand. Glass in my right hand. Move it towards your heart and touch your heart three times. And each time you do it, <clears throat> you go, Stalish. 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 You're supposed to be a warrior, man. That's the <laughs> a warrior that doesn't want to wake his kids up. <laughs> and then push it away from you three times. Machlish. 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 Oh, you're scaring the shit out of me, man. I'm telling you. And then put the glass up to the sky three times and you go, Swaslish. Swashlish, swashlish, swashlish. That's quite cool. And then you bring your glass down like a broadsword. Okay, this is your sword. You're killing the enemy. And you bring the glass down, and you go, seizlish, seizlish, Seizlish. And then you toast the, your Highlanders, you go to the left, you go slanche. Slanche. To the right, you go slanche. To the middle, you go slanche. Slanche. And then you drink all the whiskey in your glass without any stop. Let's see you do it, man. And then you must smash the glass. Just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you see that face now? Look at that. He's lost for once. I don't believe it. The first time in history he's been lost for once. So I recommend all your viewers, you should try this at home. Right, let Mark me share. Mark Lace, Mark Lace, Staley, Staley, Staley. 
sewer slave, sewer slave, sewer and sea slave. I'm trying to do this really, really good at Christmas time. I guarantee you the lounge are having a good time laughing at me right now. But for everybody, I'll show you the real thing and I'll show you how it can stir up a crowd and Jim at the helm with his Highland toast. Enjoy this. Here we go. One, two, three. Mars! 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 So that's the real oh, thing. That's the real thing. <laughs> I'm pouring, Jim. I'm pouring one of yours. This is a 2011 Isla Barley Port Charlotte. Hey, Bill Dahl has bought this glass. <laughs> My friend Bill, who's a dear friend of mine, he's been a friend of mine for 30 years, Bill. Can you believe it? He's out in California and he's claimed the glass. So I'll put this Port Charlotte in a clean glass. Uh, I've got the shakes. I'm trembling a wee bit here, Jim. You've got me stubbed up here. You've got, <laughs> you've got the adrenaline going right now. I would not recommend using that size of a dram for a Highland toast. Well, I have seen that was a, the, the one. The one that I downed was a wee bit bigger. <laughs> I remember doing a tasting at uh, at one particular tasting. Uh, the board of directors were all around the one table, and. Uh, one of our directors had a bit more than he, he should have had. So it's a circular table. And this gentleman was pretty well gone, should I say. And the chairman said to me, Jim, this, this is like the Blair Castle horse trials. There was about 200 guests. And there was like 20 at each table, big circular tables in Blair Castle. You know, it was a top, top job. And uh, everybody's got the tartan on and everybody's had a right good bucket. And uh, <clears throat> a good bucket means a lot to drink. <laughs> and the chairman said to me, uh, Jim, he said, uh, could you do the Highland Toast for our guests? I said, I don't think that's a good idea, Mr. Chairman. A lot of them are pretty drunk. No, and so was he. Uh, <clears throat> he said, no, I really insist. I am the chairman after all. I said, okay, be it on your head. And this is Blair Castle, the best, Crockery, the best. So everybody gets up, left foot the chair, right foot the table, and they've all topped up their glasses, right? And this particular person who was a senior director, who shall remain nameless, was two down from me. And there's about 18 at the table. <clears throat> so we do the Highland Toast, and he's had two too many. And he finally gets with one leg in the chair and one foot in the table. And um, we're screaming, Markley, Staley, Suisley, Seasley, Slange. So and at last Slange of that, he, he, he staggers and he goes to the right hand side. So the right hand side, he hits the next person, who hits the next person, who, and suddenly you've got 20 people <laughs> lying on their backsides on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and the only man that's left standing is the drunk man with a glass in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, put of the old God, Jim. Put of the old God. Superb. And that's superb. Funny, that was the women with fancy dresses on, the tuxedos, the kilts. It was a stramash. Oh, a circle line right there. And he's still standing. Oh, Jesus. But you should try I have, it. Home I have home to wonder, Jim, that, that must be, I've ne like I say, I've never experienced it. In, in real life, but I know what whiskey does when we're all together in a gathering and we're enjoying it together. You don't care about the things that divide you. You don't talk about religion and politics, how you how you eat, how you pray, how you vote, all of these things. You you enjoy being connected with people yeah. through your, your your appreciation for this thing this that we've created, and you're able to tap into that in those environments and stir those things that create those those moments that people will remember forever they will take them to their graves. Yeah. 
I wonder uh, who, right. who's going to step forward and 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 have you taught Adam how to do the the Highland Toast? Oh, he knows how it works because the Bradley crew all know how it works because it's part of their gig. But it was like I can't remember the gentleman's name, but it was just you had guys with tuxedos and kilts, women with fancy dresses, and they're all lying on their back on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need to see. Oh, man. I, I mentioned that Bill Dillard claimed the glass Daniel Williams is sent on the fourth floor in Leiden in the Netherlands, standing on a chair and a table. I'll never forget it. Good for you, Daniel. You've been there. Donald Rance in Canada. This is the best commute home from work ever. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's always yeah. great to have you in. And I know I'm missing a couple here. I don't want to miss these. Kia R. It looks like you're in Australia. He's saying pure gold. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome, Kia. Uh, anyway, I'm uh, going to be leaving you shortly. That's yes, right. yes, you absolutely are. I'm, I'm gonna... it's, it's almost midnight, and uh, it is. It's almost. It's uh, Jimmy Legge well, said, "Well, I've seen many great things in my 53 years, but Roy doing the Highland Toast is the best thing I've ever seen." Well, that's it. That's the Jim McEwen effect right there, Blair. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Yeah, um, you did well, Roy. Uh, the thing is, Roy. I challenge you that everywhere you go now to a social gathering, at the end of it, and it's a kind of Scottish night, you must lead the Highland Tours because you're a warrior, you understand? I'm I've challenging been... you, you must do it. People love it. They absolutely love it. After they've had five or six drums, they're right up there. Well, so, you uh, well, first if, of all, uh, if, you, if you pressure me into it, uh, you might get me doing uh, a, wee, a wee toast in the... Uh, and to raise a glass to say thanks for Jim McEwen. Jim, on that note, let me raise a glass to you. Honestly, I want to say a genuine heartfelt thanks to you. I want, firstly, to say thank you for stepping behind the bar at the V-Pub. To have you here, um, I always imagined and always hoped it would happen. I'm very, very grateful that it happened tonight. I'm gra grateful that I was able to welcome you before you stepped back, put on a pair of slippers and sat next to the fireside where you're friends and family at your side. I'm very grateful for that, Jim. But more than that, I am very, very grateful for the legacy that you've left. I'm grateful for your energy, for your enthusiasm, for your passion. Jim McEwen, I'm very, very grateful for your evangelism. Thank you for being the ambassador that you've been for, for Scotch whiskey and for Scotland, my friend. It's been an absolute privilege to welcome you here. Jim McEwen, Slanchiva. Slanchiva. <clears throat> A wee drop left here. I hope you've enjoyed it, Jim. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you. Um, and because the industry needs people like you, you are an evangelist, you, you definitely are, and you, you do a great job, an unpaid job. You, you talk passionately about the whiskey. Without people like you, we would never progress. There's not enough brand ambassadors, paid brand ambassadors in the world. It's guys like you who genuinely love it. Uh, that make the difference. And I've been to a million bars and all that stuff, and the guys behind the bars, the bartenders, the shopkeepers, the people behind the till and all that, they've got the passion. They're the real warriors. It's not the guys running about in the big <clears throat> fancy cars. It's, you know, whiskey's a drink for it. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Whiskey will enrich your life anyway. It will really enrich it. It uh, doesn't matter where your station is in life. Whiskey makes us all equal in the eyes of the Lord, for sure. It's a great, great drink. And I've had drams with rich men. I've had drams in strange places with poor people. And that always gives you hope and spirit. It warms the heart up and, yeah, it brings joy. Uh, so I'm very lucky. Um, still standing after all these years. Um, but there's a message there as well. You've got to treat it with respect. I've seen many, many people who have died young because they didn't respect the power of it. Um, and I've stood up many a grave. I'm wondering why <coughs> did John Barleycorn beat you? Because he has beaten you. John Barley's a John Barleycorn is a good friend and a bad enemy. A dangerous guy. So you've got to treat him with respect and Unfortunately, some people don't get that message, but it's thanks to guys like yourself who are educating, educating all the time. 
it's just great. So thank, thank you, thank you, Jim. And I, and I think it's 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 we're all responsible for trying to teach people that it's a flavor. It's a wonderful flavor. It's a privilege. It's a treat. It's a gift. It's not yeah. a drink. You cannot quench your thirst with whiskey. Um, yeah, that's really true. But yeah, you can, you know, there's nothing better in a time of need than a dram. In a time of crisis, there's nothing better to have to help you, to fortify you, mm -hmm. is a dram. Especially if it's been handed to you by a close friend. And you haven't had to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim McKeon. Absolutely wonderful, beautiful. Thank you so much. No, and I wish great. you all the health, all the happiness, and all the well-deserved rest, my friend. Thank you oh, so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. See you in Isla. See everybody. you in Isla. Yeah. <laughs> my goodness. I don't know how you're feeling, but I am feeling like... I always say fantastic, I say wonderful stuff, I say all of these things. But that felt special. That was a privilege. Absolutely amazing. Let me catch up with some of the comments. Greg is in the background. Uh, he's waiting. I'm going to welcome Greg in. And he can participate in a wee quiz at the end. We always close out with a quiz at the end. And we have to do it tonight. And it's a, it's a Jim McEwen flavoured themed quiz uh, at the end tonight. And I think it's an easy one. Hoyt is saying, best v -pub ever. Helen is saying, superb evening. Happy retirement to our very own Laird of Whiskey. And uh, Magic is saying, Jim is. A, and Glenn Anderson is saying, what a hero. Uh, fantastic. Whiskey Weekend Drum Harrow is saying, thanks, Jim, and Aqua Vitae. Uh, what happens to Jim at midnight? He, he skips out the room quickly in the hope that he doesn't need to buy it around. I, I actually don't think that would be true. I think he's more than likely to be the one who's buying the rounds. Watchman 999 is saying, thank you for your genuine passion and humour for Whiskey Jim and Aquaviti for your facilitation of a great V-pub. It was my privilege, my friend, honestly. Kunur Connoisseur is saying, such a hero, slancha to Jim. Hoyt is saying, I missed you, Hoyt. It's jumped. I'll catch you right now before it disappears. Hoyt is saying, fantastic storyteller. Thanks, Jim. I agree, Hoyt. Alice saying, well said, Roy, your unique whiskey is all the better for your presence and an absolute pleasure to sit there and listen with a great of classic laddie. So he's saying, uh, Jim, you're unique. Whiskey is all the better for your presence and an absolute pleasure to sit and listen with a glass of classic laddie. I know I've missed more. I'll try and catch up with it. It's, it's so fast. I'm going to send Jim something. Uh, nice, based on all the drams that you're buying me, of course. George Kaplan is in as well. George, you star. Best Thursday in a long time. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, George. I hope you and Amy are doing very, very well. And Glenis has is, is bought another wee dram to say that was a spectacular session. Thank you for making this happen. I was privileged to have Jim join us tonight. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Just a warm... And I can tell you that that is not showmanship. I spoke to Jim on a, a few phone calls, never spoken to him face to face or over the phone or anything before. And I came off every single discussion conversation I had with the man feeling energized and impassioned. Greg, give me a thumbs up if you're good to come in right now. Greg Schwartz, thank you so much for hanging about in the background for so long. Sorry you've been ignored, but I think you understand why. <laughs> Oh, I've been there, and it was—I was, uh, was just—I was an audience member tonight, you know. When, yeah. Um, it's it's always always a nice, unique pr uh, pressure to try to follow Jim. <laughs> well, you, it's, you can't, and nobody's expecting you to. So, um, I think that's the that's the amazing thing, and I I think what we're very 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 grateful for is that, you know, it's him recognizing that he's he's been gifted this thing. He's been gifted this position, but he's not kept it to himself. He's not carved his own wee furrow there. He's had these these arms, this energy that's reached out to grab anybody that was willing to listen. And it's kind of the same thing that, that whiskey has that effect on me as well. I don't think it's reasonable to try and keep it to yourself. Jimmy Jazz has seen what a fun evening, Roy. Thanks, Jim. I needed to work on the Highland Toast. I need to work on the Highland Toast. I do as well, Jimmy. Did you notice? Um, that was a surprise. That was not expected. Um, I just had to go along with it. I was put on the spot. What a legend Jim is, says Magic. 
Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Roy. Thank you, Magic. Thank you, Jimmy Jazz, as well. I hope I'm not missing these. You're going to hang around with us and participate in the quiz at the end, aren't you, Greg? I am, sure, yeah. And I'm going to get you up on a table and a chair doing a Highland Toast. I, I was glad <laughs> I was in the background when that would happen. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. It's, it's not going to happen. But, <laughs> but I, want, I wanted to see the fear in your face <laughs> that, that I felt earlier. I've been um, there. But first, what you need to do, Greg, is share what's happening the rest of the month um, sure. uh, before Jim kind of kind of steps back. It's funny because Jim is a, you know, Jim is such a great evangelist for uh, whiskey, but he he um, he doesn't uh, push himself ever. You know, uh, I mean, yes, he's part of it, and he knows he's part of it, but he doesn't. He's not. He's not vain in that way. You know, he's not vain at all. Really, he just. He, you know, he's all about the whiskey because. Yep. What what we're doing is Jim reached out to us a couple months ago and said it was time for him to step back and be a full time grandfather and husband because he's spent so much of his working life traveling the world and stuff and he just wants yeah. to spend the rest of his life with his family. And so he asked us if we could do a farewell event with him. And so we're doing that and Dram Fool's doing it with us, where on May twenty second, he's doing his last tasting of the next release of his personal casks, which and I know that's already sold out. But then on May 23rd, we're doing a thing that Jim's calling a last chat with Jim. And um, you, you know, we're uh, raising money for Jim's personal charity, which is Scotland's charity, Air Ambulance, um, which, you know, we asked him what, what charity he wanted. And that was what he chose and is quite passionate about supporting because it's literally the emergency lifeline to from that from the Hebrides to, to mainland Scotland. And uh, so, yeah, on, on the 23rd, um, Sunday, the 23rd of May, we're doing this uh, chat. It's going to be kind of like we did tonight. It's not a tasting. It's going to be more of a chat, Q&A. People are going to ask questions. We're working on a couple of surprises uh, for Jim and for, for everyone who tunes in as well. Um, we have uh, a couple of fun things we're going to do. And, you know, it's all for a good cause. So, uh, you know, we're if, if people want to join us, we sure would love it. And I know Jim would too, because we're, we're, we're trying to sell a couple hundred tickets to it to, to raise money for good cause. Well, this, this is uh this is something that I'm not going to miss. Um, I'm going to, I'm just copying the link so that, and I know that, that my moderators have been dropping in the links throughout, throughout tonight. I'm not sure that they're still here, but I've just dropped in the link as well. Um, I should also introduce Greg. Greg has been on the VPUB before. Um, Greg is the director of the, the 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 film. Actually, he's the creator. He's the guy that that realised the film, The Water of Life, that we've all been enjoying recently. Um, so, how is the format going to happen on the the last chat? Then, are we going to watch the movie? Will there be a screening, or is it is it a live stream? Anyone who buys a ticket to the event gets a free ticket to the movie. I mean, well, it's not really free; it's built into the price. But you know what I mean. It's but they, it comes with a ticket to the movie that you can watch on, at your leisure in a couple days earlier on your own. We're not all going to watch it together. Uh, you, you have 48 hours ahead of time to watch the movie whenever you want. Watch it again. And then, I mean, people can watch it. We can actually make arrangements. Our tech team will kill me for winging this because I'm not sure. But I think we usually leave it live a day after the event as well in case people miss it. Because, you know, we're dealing with time zones all over the world. And sometimes people just can't do it live with us. Got but you. the only thing that's live is the event with Jim. Uh, that's going to be at 9 p.m. BST, 1 p.m. in California where I am. The rest of you have to figure it out on where it is time zone wise, but but, um, but BST British Standard Time current time nine pm at night a, yes. a live chat with with Jim and on purchase of the ticket we get a link to that event. Yes, you get a link to that event and you get a link to the movie as well. Um, and there's also for what it's worth, how much, how much is a ticket, Greg? Uh, it's twenty dollars. I think that's like fifteen pounds, fourteen pounds, something. Like that. And remember that all of the proceeds of this is going to the the. Scotland's charity or ambulance. This is this is Jim, uh, very typical of Jim, doing this to raise money. Phil Ingram is saying, Jim reflects everything that got me into the whiskey journey. History, romance, storytelling, and hope. Hope, what a, just a, a brilliant thought, Phil. Thank you very, very much. Erwin Larang, uh, Laranaga, sorry, Erwin, is saying, Roy, did you have a birthday recently? Thanks for having Jim in the V-Pub. Uh, it made my drive home wonderful. Erwin, wonderful to have you in. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, McAllen Fine and Rare has dropped the link in as well. Time for a dram, Gregor. Roy, Jim just handed you the mantle of Highland Toaster Giver and his mentor once gave him his old tools. There's no getting away from it. We witnessed it. Thanks, Gregor. Thank you for your timely uh, reminder of such a thing. I think that was a wonderfully emotional story as well. I found myself kind of hanging on because we've all got those people in our lives that we've had to say or think or do our goodbyes with. And I, I could feel it in Jim and his reflection 
and he's grateful to that man, David Bell. He's grateful. And I know that there's people looking at Jim that right now, whether they've worked with him, whether they've been inspired by him, that are looking at Jim and being grateful too. Um, absolutely amazing, wonderful stuff. Let's get the quiz on the way. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to, I want, Jim left out a detail in the David Bell story that I think is important. But I just wanted to tell you because I think people would like to hear this. Yes, he don't, he gave, Jim gave that set of Cooper's tools to Beaumont. But Beaumont didn't just put them in a drawer somewhere. They're actually mounted on the wall in the, in the number one vaults. You know, they didn't just, they are honored. You know what I mean? They're not just some forgotten piece that, you know, so I, I, I do we, think we can, uh, uh, if we take a tour that encompasses the vaults, the number one vaults, the oldest warehouse in Scotland, the uh, below sea level, uh, Beaumont Distillery on Isla, we can see David Bell's tools. Yeah. Passed down through Jim. I mean, they were there when we were there. So they, I, I can't imagine they would have taken them down. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. That is perfect as well. Um, uh -huh, and that means it's there uh, for posterity forever. Yeah. As long as mm -hmm. we can go into the number one vaults, we can see those. That's amazing. This, is, um, this has been fantastic tonight. I'm going to close out tonight. Like we always do, there would be a mutiny if I didn't close out with a quiz at the end. But tonight it is leaning heavily on Jim's life uh, and his time and whiskey. Uh, not all the questions, but the most of them. And I think genuinely, I'm speaking to you genuinely tonight, I think it's slightly easier. And I think Greg has a chance of even making a pass mark tonight. Greg, are you up for hanging out with me too? Yeah, to yeah, let's do it. The, because let's pull up your wee poster, your wee flyer as well, so that people can get a last wee look at the details here. Uh, this is Jim's uh, flyer that you can see the Scotch sorry, Scotland's uh, charity or ambulance logo there as well. The fundraiser, 1 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Uh, BST. That's That makes sense to me. That sounds right. On the 23rd of May, which is a Sunday, Greg? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. So it's in my calendar already. I've yet to buy a ticket, but I will be buying a ticket. And I think it would be nice to come along and spend a wee bit of time, uh, a wee bit more gym time, uh, before we simply can't anymore. Quite amazing. Good luck, everybody, for the quiz at the end. Um, uh, raise a wee glass and say uh, thank you to Greg as well. Thank you for that, uh, Greg. I know that this was so much to do with you and your doing, and I'm very, very grateful for it, my friend. I'm looking forward to you and I getting to raise a glass together too. Me too. Me too. And it, it was, you know, Jim told us he was available to do some interviews and events with us, and this was the first place I thought. So um, I couldn't couldn't have been happier. Well, that deserves a dram and a hug, Greg. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Okay, because at the end I've passed this along to Doc and asked Doc to give it his once over and he said, aye Roy, you've been kind to everybody tonight. His rating tonight is that, oops, that isn't correct, is it? It's kind of be the right quiz. That's not, he said it was going to be easy. Um, anyway, Doc's rating is not that it starts easy. It starts easy and stays easy. I think the updates, I haven't refreshed the link. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It should be good. I've not had to change any questions tonight. Question one, in terms of production, what does Isla's Ardenhoe and Brookladdy have in common? This came up recently in a VPUB, came up recently in the quiz as well. Is it A, the type of grain mill? Is it B, the pot still set up? Or is it C, open cast iron mash tuns. So what does the new distillery on Isla Ardenhoe have in common with the 1881 distillery, which previously was one of the new distilleries, believe it or not, Brookladdy, what do they have in common? Is it A, the type of grain mill? Is it B, the pot still set up? Or is it C, the open cast iron mash tuns? And Whiskey Throttle Daniel is absolutely spot on. He's saying, yes, it's easy for the doc. And I think that's true. It's based on his knowledge. Greg, do you know this one? I think I do, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Go right ahead and share what you think it is. C. Open cast iron mash tuns. That is at Brook Laddie, but they have a stainless steel mash tun. Yeah. At Ardenhoe. It's the both share a Bobby Mill, which is a... The Porteous is the there's the mill that's the kind of generally a red mill in most places. Right, I, yeah. I think it's green everywhere, but they have a bobby mill uh, at Brookladdy and also at Ardenhoe. Greg, you're struggling. 
<laughs> Question two. In 2021, Jim McCune released his own signature collection with all first releases featuring what? This Jim idea. McCune's first own personal whiskey releases. They were all Isla Barley, or B, they were all French wine cask matured, or C, they were heavily peated Octomore spirit. Do you know this one? Have you be guessing, Greg? I'm, I'm pretty sure I know this one. Okay, good. James Morgan is admitting that he's picked from the crowd. He's crowdsourced his first one, and he's saying thanks, Stream, for one out of one. <laughs> Perfectly great to be uh, to be doing that. That's exactly what it's all about. You're only playing against yourself in this. But I have to say that this might be a banana skin for a lot, but uh, the, the thing that's connected the first three releases, and Jim talked about it heavily this evening in, in general context, is B, French wine maturation. Again, he can't disclose who the chateaus are, um, but the style of wine cask is there. Octomore, Port Charlotte, and Brookladdy releases. Question three. Jim McCune's first job at Bamore at age 15 was what? A, goods receiving, B, brewing, C, coopering. Now, I know that there is a wee bit of ambiguity here um, because he was first given a six-week contract to sweep floors and make tea and do everything. But his first job, his first official job at Bamore way back in 1963 was... The lounge has absolutely got this. This is an easy one for the lounge. James Morgan is is absolutely shouting it it's that, that he thinks it's the... What is it, Greg? C. I, mean, was, I, was going, I, I would have said sweeping if that had been an option because I know he did that. That's right. But Yeah, that's right. He, when he was first, he turned up and asked if he could have a job and he said, we'll employ you for six weeks. And he was doing everything and eventually he impressed and he, and he got put forward for a, a role. They had to campaign for him to have the Cooper's position. Um, yes. The, the, a lawyer that his mother worked for wrote a letter to the Cooper's union asking him to make an exemption to take yeah. on an extra apprentice. Because they had to have four or five employed Coopers in order to have one apprentice or something, and they only had three there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it was Davy Bell, because he was the number one, apparently, was able to carry enough weight to help swing it. I, and, I and, and he that. had to delay his own retirement, David Bell did, to finish Jim's. The deal was he he had to finish Jim's training, and he, he delayed his retirement two years. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Amazing. Question four. Brookladdy's Yellow Submarine series is actually named after what? What is the Yellow Submarine series of releases? It was originally just a single release, but they've since brought out more Yellow Submarine releases. But what is it named after? Is it named after a 1960s animated <laughs> movie? Is it named after a famous club and whiskey bar? Or is it named after an actual yellow submarine? A, a 1960s animated movie. B, a famous club and whiskey bar. Or C, an actual yellow submarine. I told you that today the <laughs> quiz would be a wee bit easier than normal, right? We're celebrating tonight. I don't think I've ever seen the answers in the in the lounge for the quiz move so fast. Almost absolutely everybody, Yellow Submarine, is in fact named after Greg. C. An actual Yellow Submarine. This was a submarine that was brought in on to the shores of Islas uh, by fishermen, <laughs> um, and it was uh, it was from HMS Blythe. It was lost. It was an, actually an ROV, not an actual submarine, but an ROV, a remote, remotely operated vehicle. Um, and when they called the number on the side, because the number said this belongs to the Ministry of Defence, and they called <laughs> the number and the Ministry of Defence said, no, it's not our submarine, we haven't lost a submarine. Um, so <laughs> glad he made the most out of the story and the publicity that this caused, and they, they had a whiskey release. Sometime later, and it's very interesting, you can see the submarine hoisted above the Brookladdy Open Day at Fischiel 2016, and that was because somebody spotted that that submarine was decommissioned and available to buy on eBay and Brookladdy stepped up and purchased the submarine and it's now on display 
the Brooklady Distillery. <laughs> Quite fascinating story. <laughs> Lots more details on the internet about the Yellow Submarine. Uh, very, very cool uh, story behind it as well. This is the only departure, I think, tonight from uh, Jim McEwen. This is a picture from Graham Fraser, one of the barflies, takes a lot of pictures, visits a lot of distilleries. Huge contributor to the Barflies Facebook page as well. And I'm obviously just going to ask you what distillery are we looking at here? Are we looking at Glendronach in the Eastern Highlands? Are we looking at Blair Athol in the Southern Highlands? Or Edredour in the Southern Highlands? Which distillery are we looking at here? This is a tougher one for you, Greg, I imagine. Uh, I think I know. I'm not 100% sure, though. I just know which, I know one it's not because I've been to one of them. So you've visited Edradar and you know yeah. that that's picket fences and whitewash. Yeah. yeah. So you know it's a 50-50. What are you going for? I, you know what? I'm going to go with Glendronic. Um There are aspects of Glendronic that look a wee bit similar to that, but don't yeah, have nearly true. as much wisteria as Blair Athol. And in fact, the front of the distillery, they've got to actively take huge chunks of this off because it can completely block out the front of the stand and, and here this view as well. It grows like crazy, this stuff. But there you go. It's Blair Athol in the Southern Highlands. Question? Sorry, Greg, go ahead. I was going to say, when we shot the film, we, we talked about Glendronic, but we didn't go there because uh, we went to Ben Riek instead. And we sent an away team to Glen Glasso, but not to Glendronic. Well, I have to admit, I've never visited Glendronic. I've not been to Glendronic myself. I've been to Blair Athol a couple of times, but not Glendronic either. Um, so it's likely that if I saw a Glendronic picture, I could sometimes get that one wrong for sure. Question six. Some of Brickladdy's high providence releases have sourced beer barley from Dunlosset Estate, which is where? Where is Dunlosset Estate? Is it A on Isla? Is it B in Campbelltown? Or is it C in Orkney? Beer Barley, in fact, the one that I have is a Dunlosset release. And it tells me on the label where it is. Um, so the Beer Barley, obviously one of these ancient grains of barley that was brought back. It's a famous story about uh, one of the weapons of mass destruction releases was based on the fact when they first tried to mash beer, it turned to almost concrete. And we, when they switched on um, the rakes, it snapped the rakes. <laughs> Um, but the Dunlosset release specifically, is it from Isla, Campbelltown, or Orkney? Do you know this one, Greg, or are you guessing? I, I do know this one, yeah. It's, of course, Dunlosset okay. is in Isla. In fact, I think there was a distillery, a Losset distillery, at some point way back in the past. And um, I believe there will be no more Dunlosset estate bare barley, is, if I'm not mistaken. I think they've told Brickladi it's they just can't do it anymore. And all the future ones will come from Orkney. Well, that's what the banana skin in the question was, that, that so many of the beer barley uh, contract farmers are actually in Orkney. Um, and specifically Dunloss, it was the one on Isla that was providing the barley. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So it's going to be Orkney barley uh, for beer barley releases from here on I, in. We did an event last weekend with Adam, and he, he answered questions to that effect about the future. Fantastic. It does quite well on, on, on Orkney. Superb. Um, didn't they get bought by Kilhoman, Daniel, at Whiskey Throttle, is saying? Oh, you're thinking of Rockside Farm, Daniel. Slightly different. So Rockside Farm is out on the rins of Isla, and Dunlosset is kind of uh, just north of the centre of Isla, um, uh, up towards, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the place that's up there, but uh, up further towards Bridge End, a wee bit east of Bridge End. Question seven. Jim McEwen can claim to have done what in his career? Hopefully I'm getting through this quiz quite quickly tonight. A, a he has matured whiskey in Scotland's oldest warehouse. B, distilled whiskey in Scotland's oldest still room. Or C, fermented wort in Scotland's oldest washbacks. What can Jim McEwen claim to have done in his career? Matured whiskey in Scotland's oldest warehouse, distilled whiskey in Scotland's oldest still room, or fermented wort in Scotland's oldest washbacks? <laughs> Jerry Miller is saying, hurry, hurry, the plane is descending, we'll lose Wi-Fi soon. Sorry, Jerry, I'll get through it as quick as I possibly can. <laughs> Greg, you know this one? 
I think Jim said it tonight. Did he not? Good whiskey. Yeah. Scotland's hey. oldest warehouse vaults. Uh, warehouse number one, uh, right next to the sea, as Jim said. The sea's on the other side of the wall, and I believe that some of the warehouse is actually below sea level. Question eight for Jimmy Miller. Jim was proud to once work for Suntory, who owns which of these Japanese distilleries? Which of these is owned by Suntory? Is it A, Hakushu, B, Miyagikyo, or C, Yoichi? If I go by Max pronunciation, it's not Hakushu, it's Hakushu. A, Hakushu, B, Miyagikyo, C, Yoichi. Which of those is owned by Suntory? Would you know this one, Greg, or would you be guessing this one? I'd be guessing on this. Throw a dart, what would you guess? Uh, C. Yoichi, peated and owned by Nika. You're looking for Hakushu. Hakshu is owned by Suntory, the same company that now owns, and interestingly, not just Bamor, but also Lefroig these days yeah, as well. Uh, so it's about and Ockentoshin, right? And Ockentoshin, Glengarry, Ardmore. Question nine, what was the name of the Australian distillery Jim is involved with during his retirement? And I've put retirement in the quotation marks, of course. Um, but he has uh, been very active with an Australian distillery as well and involved in gin and whiskey. Is it A, Cape Byron? Is it B, White Label Distillery? Or is it C, Loch Distillery? Now, I can tell you that all of those distilleries exist in Australia, but specifically, I'm looking for the one that Jim McEwen has been involved with in recent years. You must know this one, Greg, I guess. I, I do. I spent a week there. <laughs> Wonderful. Amazing. I, I watched them run Spirit for the first time. Whiskey? Yeah. Whiskey Spirit. I have, yeah. I have a bottle of the new make somewhere. Oh, it's, it's in my liquor cabinet. There's so many, so many distilleries in Australia, but they're all tiny. We get none of it here to try. I know. So well, you know, I would like, you know, the, in the event we're doing with Jim, I would like to say that, you know, the, the tasting sets we were selling with the Jim's biography and everything, they're sold out, but it actually is going to involve a dram of the very first whiskey from. I don't Keep want to give away the answer. Yeah. That's, a, that's amazing. That's a very, very cool thing. Shame that it's sold out, but hopefully some of the barflies managed to get their hands on it. Okay, I nope. don't think it's too much of an ask that question tonight for question 10. It is a bit tricky. I've saved, I think, the trickiest question to last. Good luck, everybody. Previous to the Water of Life film, Jim was featured in another film called Scotch, The Golden Dram, but it was directed by who? Who was the director of The Golden Dram? Greg will probably know this. Was it A, Andrew Peet? B, Andrew Heather, or C, Andrew Moss? Who was the director of the Golden Dram? I'm assuming you know this, Greg, but maybe I you do, don't. I do know this, yeah. You do know this, yeah. <laughs> I had to put this one in. I'm looking to see if there's anybody going to be scoring a 10 out of 10 tonight. There's got to be quite a few. We've got to be quite a few. So you can tell us the answer, the director of The Golden Dram a couple of years ago. Is A. Amazing, right? Amazing. It's Andrew Peet was the director. We always Andrew joke Pete. that he should team up with uh, Jim Beveridge from uh, yeah, <laughs> Diageo. From Diageo. Yeah, it's just, I mean, some of these names are too perfect for... <laughs> Absolutely, Andrew Pete. It's quite incredible. Let's have a wee look to see who managed a ten out of ten tonight in the in the lounge. Um, Nine out of ten for Chuck Malt Minion. Uh, six out of ten for Andrew Pierce. He's saying that'll do. Evo is on eight out of ten. Mark and it. Helen is on ten out of ten. Helen, well done again. Fantastic. Congratulations for your ten out of ten. One glass man. Warner. Jimmy Jazz. Catherine Bono. All on seven. Control is suggesting he's on thirteen out of ten. Good for you, buddy. Well done. Uh, Jerry Miller on seven. Hey, molasses on seven as well. I'm looking to see if I can get any more 10 out of tens tonight before I say goodbye and thank you to my friend Greg Schwartz here. So tell me, share if you manage the 10 out of 10. Um, five out of 10 pass mark for magic. Well done. Scott Allen is in. Good to see you. Seven out of 10 made a comeback. Superb, Scott. Good for you. Graham Fraser on nine out of 10. So close. So yeah, the doc was maybe wrong. He, The doc predicted that there would be six or seven 10 out of 10s, and it may actually be the case. It's just that people are currently doing laps of their living room or wherever they are, celebrating, getting a wee 10 People are doing 10. Highland toasts. Exactly. Um, well can, done I say something, can I say something quick too? If people are going to join us on the 23rd, in the meantime, they should practice the Highland toast. Just saying. 
Superb. <laughs> Superb. I'm going to, after the credits roll tonight, I'm going to run that video one more time just to let them see <laughs> and just let them feel it a wee bit more. I was put on the spot tonight and I probably didn't do it justice. Um, if, I, if I knew it was coming, I'd have probably been ready and I'd, I'd have had uh, the, the kind of, but I, okay, I went with it. I'm not going to watch it back, that's for <laughs> sure, Greg. Oh, anyway, Greg, sorry. You were fine. You. you were great. <laughs> I'm going to say a big thank you to you. I reached out to you way, I don't know if it was earlier this year or at the end of last year, um, but anyway. immediately just felt like I was connecting with a pal, honestly. You're a very easy guy to talk to. You obviously have been bitten by whiskey and the bug and everything that goes around it, and you're doing a very good service as well because the movie that you've made, as we talked about, is not something for you to run off and be rich. It was, right. it was a labor <laughs> of love. It was a passion project, and I'm always very appreciative right. of that. And uh, I'm looking forward to watching it again. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you on the 23rd as well. Me too. Um, for the excellent uh, charity cause as well. And what a treat. I think I feel like uh, I was treated tonight. And uh, I know you had a part to play in that as well, Greg. I'll raise a glass for Greg Schwartz, for everybody behind. What's the name of the company behind the, the production team behind the Waterlife film? Blacksmith and Jones. Blacksmith and Jones for everybody at the team uh, for the continued success of the film. I'm looking for a Netflix release soon. This fall, hopefully, yeah. Fantastic, Greg. Thank you so much, yes. my friend. Slash for you. Stay backstage, won't you? And we'll say we'll say good night. Thank you, Greg Schwartz. Thank you to all you wonderful, wonderful barflies and very, very patient. Uh, uh, beautiful whiskey folk. I noticed that we're two and a half hours, but honestly, I was expecting that tonight. I'm very, very grateful to Jim McEwen. He spent a lot more uh, time with us than I could have reasonably asked for. I had a brilliant time. I could have listened to the guy talking all night. It was just, like I say, a privilege and a treat. Jimmy Legg has bought me a dram. How does it feel to be able to bring McEwen to the group of people that you've assembled? Can you believe how far the VPUB has come? Jimmy, it's because of folk like you. Is because of all the barflies that turn up week after week after week. If it's not, if you're not here, I'm just a guy sh shouting into a mic in his spare room. You, if Jim talks about the lifeblood of Scotland being whiskey, you, the barflies, the beautiful whiskey folk, you're the lifeblood of the VPUB, the community. That's what it's all about. I don't know what's going to happen after lockdown lifts everywhere. Things will get quieter around the VPUB, I don't doubt, but that's okay as long as there are willing, enthusiastic, generous, caring, wonderful barflies like you, Jimmy, and everybody else that's here, I will consider it a privilege to be here too. You're all very dearly loved. I'll be back next week. We don't know what the topic's going to be yet because there's kind of the schedule's been thrown about a wee bit. Glenn Cadam's been pushed to the week after next, so it's going to just probably be a solo thing for me next week. And then uh, something interesting at the end of the month as well. In the meantime, I'll raise this glass. Thank you all for hanging out with me for another Thursday Night VPUB. It's been an absolute blast and a pleasure. I hope you've had fun too. And I really look forward to welcoming you all again a week from tonight. Slanchava, everybody. Cheers. I just can't promise a Jim McMillan next week. <laughs> Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you. Marvish! Marvish! Marvish!